Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others. You are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus Welcome to Event Update on AAE TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update is all about information on upcoming higher education events and scholarship opportunities in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. My name is Isabella Tetahinakwa. What's the email that I'm with African Critical Inquiry Program, ASIP, is pleased to announce the Ivan Cap Doctoral Research Awards 2021 to support African graduate students in the humanities and humanistic social sciences who are studying at South African universities and working on related dissertation studies. This program aims to promote discussion and inquiry into the positions and practices of public culture public cultural institutions, and public scholarship in shaping African identities and society. Awards are open to all African postgraduate students in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. Applicants must be enrolled in a South African university's PhD program and working on topics relevant to ASIP's mission. Projects focusing on topics such as institutions of public culture, particular aspects of museums and exhibitions, forms and practices of public scholarship, as well as culture and communication will be sponsored. Interested applicants are to submit a completed cover sheet, abstract of the proposed research project, research proposal outlining the project's goals, central questions, significant and relevant for ASIP central concerns, curriculum vita, current transcripts, and two reference letters as a single file via ASIP uwc at gmail.com with the heading ASIP 2021 Research Award Publication before 3rd May 2021. Visit www.graduateschool.mori.edu for more information. Le programme africain d'enquête critique est heureux d'annoncer les événements CAP Doctoral Research Awards 2021 pour soutenir les étudiants africains diplômé en sciences humaines et sociales humanistes qui étudie dans les universités sud-africaines et travaille sur les études de thèse connexes. Ce programme vise à promouvoir la discussion et l'enquête sur les positions et les pratiques de culture publique, des institutions culturelles publiques et des bourses publiques pour façonner les identités africaines et la société. Les prix sont ouverts à tous les étudiants africains de troisième cycle en sciences humaines et sociales humanistes. Les candidats doivent être inscrits au doctorat d'une université sud-africaine. Programme et travail sur les sujets pertinents pour la mission de la ACIP. Des projets axés sur des sujets tels que les institutions de la culture publique, des aspects particuliers, des musées et des expositions, 
des formes et des pratiques d'érudition publique, ainsi que la culture et la communication seront parrainées. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre une feuille de couverture remplie, résumé du projet de recherche proposé, proposition de recherche décrivant les objectifs du projet, questions centrales, signification et pertinence pour les préoccupations centrales de la ACIP. Curriculum vitae, transcription actuelle et deux lettres de référence en un seul fichier via acip.uwc.gmail.com avec la rubrique de monde de prix de recherche ACIP 2021 avant le 3 mai 2021. Visitez le www.graduateschool.imori.edu pour plus d'informations. The Association of African Universities is pleased to announce a call for nominations from members of the association for the positions of president, vice president, and members of the governing board to serve for the period 2021 to 2025. Members of the association in good standing who are duly qualified candidates are invited to make nominations for election by completing the online form via the link on the screen before 20th June 2021. Interested candidates should kindly refer to the rules and general conditions in accordance with the AAU bylaws as well as all other relevant information via the link provided on the screen. L'Association des universités africaines est priée d'annoncer un appel à candidature de membres de l'association pour les postes de président, vice-président et membres du conseil d'administration pour la période 2021-2025. Les membres en règle de l'association, qui sont des candidats d'une qualifié, sont invités à faire des nominations pour l'élection en remplissant le formulaire en ligne via le lien à l'écran avant le 20 juin 2021. Les candidats intéressés doivent se référer avec bonté aux règles et conditions générales conformément au bail lors de l'AUA ainsi qu'à toutes les autres informations pertinentes via le lien fourni à l'écran. The Africa Higher Education Research Institute, AHERI, is pleased to present to you Fireside Chat, a conversation on the pandemic and its effect on internship programs in Kenyan higher education institutions. AHERI focuses on research through conferences, colloquia and high-level discussions with a view of making higher education relevant to sustainable development in Africa. This chat will provide platforms for presenters and discussants to clarify the opportunities the pandemic has offered to remedy the previous challenges or restructure the industrial attachments. For more inquiries, email info at aheri.org or call plus 254 2020 L'Institut africain de recherche sur l'enseignement supérieur est heureux de vous présenter un chat côté feu, une conversation sur la pandémie et ses effets sur les programmes de stage dans les établissements d'enseignement niveau. Ce chat fournira des plateformes aux présentateurs et aux intervenants pour clarifier les opportunités que la pandémie a offertes pour remédier aux défis précédents ou restructurer l'attachement industriel. Pour plus de demandes, envoyez un courrier à info.aerie.org ou appelez le 254 le 20 20 47 216. Applications for the World Bank Robert McNamara Fellowship Program, RSMFP, is open to inspire development economics researchers from developing countries with World Bank Research Economists creating unique opportunities for the fellows to participate in rigorous policy-relevant research. Applicants will have a unique opportunity to widen their perspective on potential development questions and how their research can address challenges in a developing country. To be eligible, applicants must be nationals of World Bank Group member countries, graduates of MA level studies, not more than 35 years of age, and must be available to relocate to Washington, D.C. for the duration of the fellowship. Interested applicants should submit a resume 
statement of purpose in PDF file, contact of at least one academic reference and writing sample. The application is open till 30th April 2021. And for more information, email rsm underscore fellowships at worldbank.org. Les candidatures au programme de bourse Robert M.C. Namara de la Banque mondiale sont ouvertes pour inspirer les chercheurs en économie du développement des pays en développement. Les économistes de la recherche de la Banque mondiale créant des opportunités uniques pour les boursiers de participer à des recherches rigoureuses, pertinentes pour la politique. Les candidats auront une occasion unique d'élargir leur point de vue sur les questions de développement potentiel et comment leurs recherches peuvent relever les défis dans le monde en développement. Pour être éligibles, les candidats doivent être des ressortissants des pays membres du GBM de la Banque mondiale, des diplômés des études de niveau MA, âgés de plus de 35 ans et doivent être disponibles pour déménager à Washington DC pendant la durée de la bourse. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre une curriculum vita, une déclaration d'intention dans un fichier PDF, un contact avec au moins d'une référence académique et un échantillon écrit. L'application est ouverte jusqu'au 30 avril 2021 et pour plus d'informations par email, envoyez à rsm fellowship@worldbank.org. The Covenant University Capric is in partnership with INRIA French National Research Institute for Digital Sciences and AIDS Impact DSTN with the support of Agence Française de Développement AFD. It's inviting you to their two weeks workshop on higher performance computing, basics and intermediates scheduled from 17th May to 28th May 2021. The aim of this workshop is to introduce system administrators who are currently responsible for high performance computing infrastructure in their various research higher education institutions to the most cutting edge HPC technologies. All system administrators in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to apply and, and must complete the application form via the link on the screen. Email is at covenantuniversity.edu.ng or visit www.aids.covenantuniversity.edu.ng slash workshop for more information. Covenant University, en partenariat avec ERIA, Institut National de Recherche en Sciences Numériques et AIDS Impact, la DSTN, avec le soutien de l'Agence Française de Développement vous invite à leur atelier de deux semaines sur le calcul haute performance, base et intermédiaire du 7 mai au 28 mai 2021. L'objectif de cet atelier est d'introduire des administrateurs système qui sont actuellement responsables de l'infrastructure de calcul haute performance dans leurs divers établissements de recherche, enseignement supérieur aux technologies, la HPC, les plus avancées. Tous les administrateurs systèmes au Nigeria et en Afrique subsaharienne doivent postuler et doivent remplir le formulaire de demande via la liaison à l'écran et aussi envoyer un courriel à as.covenantuniversity.edu.ng ou encore visiter le www.as.covenantuniversity.edu.ng .covenantuniversity.edu.ng bar workshop pour plus d'informations. Thank you for being with us. Events update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAUTV official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org. I am Isabella Tetahinapa. Je suis Imelda Amoudi.
Hello Africa, welcome to the CGC show on AETV. AETV is the voice of higher education in Africa. We are coming to you live from the headquarters of the Association of African Universities here in Accra, Ghana. My name is Aja Omi and I am your host. Don't forget the show is proudly brought to you by the Association of African Universities. You can join in the conversation by visiting our social media platforms at A underscore TV on Twitter, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, and at AETV Official on Instagram. Today we'll be discussing disc jockey or DJ as a career. My guest is here in the studios. I'll introduce her after the break. Big thank you going out to GD Makeover for my beautiful makeup and of course Akusia Collection GH for my outfits. We'll be back after the break. Stay tuned. Just tuned in, you are watching the CGC show on AETV, and today we will be discussing disc jockey, which is DJing as a career. My guest is in the person of Miss Michelle Yebwa, who is a renowned DJ in Ghana, here to tell us, give us everything you need to know about um, DJing as a career. Welcome on the show. Thank you. I like your mask. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, 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 I yes. Can you give us an introduction? What do you do? Who are you? Tell, tell us. What's your Okay, idea? so like you said, the name is Michelle Yeboa. Okay. But I mean, DJing is the max DJing. Okay. Because the mask, yeah. Okay. And I've been DJing for like about eight years now. Wow. And yeah, I mean, so far as I'm still doing something, mm. something is working. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I'm here today to talk to you about being a DJ as mm. a career. How, how has the journey been for you? It's been it's been good, but I mean, with everything or even every career path, there is the good and there is the bad. Okay. So yeah, there's been some ups and downs, mm. but we've been able to work around it. I see. Yeah. When did you decide to do DJing? or take that as a career path? With, uh, um, I don't even remember like the exact particular time I'm like, <laughs> okay, I want to take DJing as a career, but what I know is, and even with all these revelations, I realized them later after I became a DJ, because okay. I realized that since growing up, I've always mm -hmm. wanted to do something related to music, but it didn't, I can't sing, I can't dance, I mean, so, but I knew, and I mean, when I watch TV then, and I see a DJ, be it, a woman or mm. a man I'm like ah like there was a strong mm. connection like this is what I think I want to do mm. but then looking at it I mean even with now currently being a DJ still has its own pros and cons so imagine that time yeah so I never really thought of it as a career trend, but I just knew that there was some sort of connection mm. so when I went to when I was in uh, senior high school I think I told a couple of friends but it still didn't make sense like why do you even want to be a DJ yeah. being a female to on top so like mm -hmm. but i just left it like that i think mm -hmm. i want to be a, i think i want to be a dj so i went to university and i was i i had a software so i was just playing with it on my laptop okay. uh, it was just something i was doing when i'm bored mm -hmm. yeah because i'm like okay but i didn't even really know how to use it but just because i felt that was what i wanted to do mm -hmm. i was just practicing until i met someone who said oh he could teach me how to dj he taught me and i've been doing it from that's quite impressive yeah impressive. And you've been in the game for... Yeah, um, for like eight, eight years. years, yeah. Interesting. Um, would you, before I ask my next question, would you classify DJing or disc jockey as a creative art um, industry or an entrepreneurial business? I think it's creative arts. It's, it's creative yeah, arts. Yeah, it's creative arts. Yeah. Why? Because, I mean, so far as you're playing music, you need to have the, um, you, you need to have an ear for mm -hmm. good music. You need to know what the crowd wants to listen to. And most of the times, because um, the art of DJing has to do with the people dancing, people yeah. really don't look at their work 
the DJ is putting in mm. to put out. Because if we say, if I say everyone here should play music, everyone can play music from mm. their phones. But then it's how the music is going to follow each other, the mm. sequence, how to know the vibe is right. So it definitely has something to do with creativity. Yeah. That's how I feel is more of a creative um, okay. venture than an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial venture. Business. Yeah. So you don't go in for the money per se. No, no. You just I didn't. I didn't go up saying I wanted to be a DJ for the mm. money. No, no. I see. You mentioned um, that there's definitely pros and cons to yes. this business, but we'll delve deeper into that. I'd want you to tell me, if someone wants to become a DJ, what are some of the qualities that he or she needs to have? We, we, we are not even talking <laughs> about the skill. Yeah. The inbuilt qualities that a person should have before he or she can say that, I want to become a DJ. I think that one, it will, it will depend. Everybody's different. Yeah. Everyone is different. So it will definitely depend on you, the person, and your qualities. So I can't even say for a fact that, oh, you need to do this or you need to have that mm. to be a DJ. I mean, when everyone has, has their talents, mm. like you are hosting the show now. Yeah. I mean, you realized what, um, what you wanted to do, and that's what has brought you here. So okay. I think it's an individual mm. thing for everyone. So I cannot speak for everyone. everyone. Okay. Yeah, but I think if you know this is your talent, you know this is your talent. So it's just up to you to work mm. on it to make it happen. Yeah. But let's say for, let's take you for example. Yeah. What do you think are the qualities that have helped you scale up in your career? Um, Basically, liking music is the first thing because DJing has to be with um, it has to be about music. Okay. So I, I I've always found like I I like music too much mm -hmm. for let me say a normal person. Everyone listens to music. That's the fact. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are people who go out of their way to find new music and want to share it with other people. Yeah. So yeah, in sharing music with other people, you realize oh okay then you mm -hmm. go with that. And when we say disc jockey, DJing, we all know it's just you getting the, how do you call Ten it, the turntables, yeah. doing your scratches. Or yeah. Do we have any, like, can you give us a definition of disc jockey? So I, I think uh, the general definition of a disc jockey is someone who breaks music mm -hmm. to people normally people now we play what everyone wants to hear because mm. maybe that's what's trendy but ideally one of the things that dj is always supposed to do is mm -hmm. introducing his or her audience to new music and getting them to like feel you know like it's just about exploring yeah so yeah being a dj is getting your audience to enjoy music mm. dance to the music and you know yeah you being a female, has there been any form of uh, <laughs> <laughs> any form of discrimination or I don't know, probably stigmatization, anything? Yeah, you know, like even with every other career mm -hmm. choice, being a woman is a bit harder yeah. than yeah. But with this jockeying, this jockeying is something that is really, really, really male dominated. It's assumed it's a man's job automatically. Mm -hmm. So it's like being a woman and then trying to break into that kind of field it's a bit difficult because mm -hmm. everyone thinks it's supposed to be for men mm -hmm. you get that kind of thing so yes it's been difficult and i think it comes with you proving how good you are mm -hmm. or how like because if you do it for a certain while mm -hmm. i think people just forget the fact that oh okay it's a man's job or it's a woman's mm -hmm. job because at the end of the day they are looking at what you bring yeah. where you are doing yeah but in the beginning yeah it looked like why do you want to be a dj mm -hmm. why do you want to be a dj it's for men it's for men but i mean we are here now so but I see a lot of female DJs growing in Africa, especially Ghana, Nigeria, yes. and South Africa. I see them like being coming into in the industry. Yeah. Doing eight, I think eight years ago, when I wanted to be a DJ, I knew of only one female DJ, only one. But now I can maybe I can get you about eight or ten DJs, yeah. female DJs. Yeah. So people are, and are embracing it, and they are doing well. extremely well. Yeah. Yes, all all of them that I know are doing extremely well. So. What do you think has brought up? has made you people get the recognition that you yeah you are getting right now i think basically it's society trying to understand that we have put ourselves in the box and mm. there's nothing like this one is for men and this one is for women yeah. we are all human beings mm -hmm. so far as you can walk go and come i can also <laughs> walk go and come i don't see why we should say okay this one is for men and this mm. one is for women so i think people are breaking out of that box mm. when it comes to career opportunities and i think that it's actually a beautiful thing because mm -hmm. to be honest being a dj is not easy so because there is the whole equipment back and forth there's like a lot of technical side to being a dj so being a woman even if you are not uh i don't know the word to use but you should have some sort of 
uh, to go mentality. Mm -hmm. Like you need to get things that you need to set things up because you don't have uh, someone following you to go set up your mm -hmm. controllers and stuff. There's a lot of wiring and you have to do all yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just we just come to a place where women also believe they can do everything. Yeah. Maybe we weren't given the opportunity then or we were put in a box, but now I think people feel like okay, so far as I can do this and do it well, I'm going to do it regardless yeah. of the agenda. I see. Yeah. You have your mask on yeah. and you are, your name is actually, um, the your brand DJ. name, you work under the brand name, The, mes the Mask DJ. DJ. Yeah. G has your branding played a major role in your career? No. Because I, when, when I started out, I wasn't doing the, I wasn't, I wasn't wearing the mask. Okay. I, yeah, I didn't, I started wearing the mask, I think, uh, 2014, 2015, about. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really have anything to do with it. Because then again, like I said, if I come and I'm, um, I'm a bad DJ, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. If I'm a bad DJ, the mask is not going to change the fact yeah. that I'm a bad DJ. And if I'm a good DJ too, the mask is not going to change the fact mm -hmm. that I'm a good DJ. So this is just for the branding, but I think it has nothing to do with how good or how bad. Right. If I'm bad, I'm bad. If I'm yeah. good, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an identity. It's just to be different from yeah, everyone. Okay. It's just to stand out. Okay. Yeah. Because I see a couple of DJs. Some have like all all pink all the time. Some people are dressed up all black all, all the, the time. time. Okay. So those are the things that they use to identify. That's probably them. that's their personality. Okay. They might have their reasons. Yeah. I don't know. But mm. even when my the max to I'm really really a shy person. Mm. Um, I wanted to be different, I wanted to stand out and I also didn't want to um, deal with people when I'm DJing because I remember an incident where someone said something and maybe to him it wouldn't be a big deal but for me starting out at that time I felt it felt wrong mm. to me and I was sad about it. I'm like okay if I'm going to do this DJing thing I need to figure out a way where I wouldn't have to deal with people coming over to even talk to me. I wanted it to be unapproachable i wanted it to be anonymous so you are just listening to the music yeah. that's coming but you have no business interacting with me whilst i dj so mm -hmm. that's basically how come the mask came into being i see i would want you to talk more about how to become a dj okay. some of the things that you need in terms of equipment and probably training that you need to go through so okay. we'll do that after the break okay. don't go anywhere we'll be right back So the CGC show on AAU TV and we have been discussing disc jockey as a career. My guest, Miss Michelle Yebois, who works under the brand name The Mask DJ, has talked about, shared, she has sh actually shared her experience um, in the industry and some of the things that, um, the skills that she, she based on to analyze or to conclude that she wants to do DJ. I would want you to tell me, if someone in the university wants to become a DJ, what are, the, what are some of the courses that he or she needs to study? Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't even know, but just like every other creative person, I mean, when, let's take a painter, for example. Okay. When someone says they're a painter, I don't think, well, people go to school to mm -hmm. learn these things, but normally before someone says, okay, I'm going to a painting school, he or she has done a few things to yeah. know that, okay, I can paint. Okay. It's only when people enter these things for, I mean, the money, that's when then they go to learn their mm. skills. But mostly, most creators already know how to do what they want to do. So going to school is actually a top up or to just perfect whatever skills they have. But with DJing, I think normally what people do is they go to... Um, Ghana Institute of Journalism, because mm. I think most people yeah, do radio. Yeah. So that's, but I didn't go to a DJing school. I wouldn't advise anyone to go to a, a <laughs> DJ not school. Not because it's not it's good. It's good okay. if you want to go to a DJ. In future, I mean, I would like to go to certain mm -hmm. schools to learn certain mm -hmm. things to make my craft better and more professional. But it's one of those things, too, that you can do without not going to school. Okay. So I don't even have... Unless you are going to a music school. I know there are DJ schools. There mm -hmm. are production schools. So unless you are going to school to specifically learn that, I don't think as an now our universities offer 
any course directly DJ, for DJs. DJs. Okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. but there are online courses. There are online courses you can pay for, and mm. then you get certifications at the end. And there are other schools I know for outside. I don't mm. really know about Ghana yeah, okay. that you can also go to DJ mm -hmm. schools. But with our universities, I I don't know what uh, course you have to <laughs> study to be a DJ. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically, it doesn't have any educational limitation. No, 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 no. You only we need have, to have we, a skill. Yes. And we passion. have we have DJs who have like a very high um academic background mm. we have some to have no academic background but when it comes into the djing field they are they can be on the same level i have um djing colleagues who one was actually a professor at ashesi mm -hmm. university a grown married man but he's a dj dj wow. but he's yes but people will be wondering okay are djs are school dropouts no i know a lot of djs masters holders undergraduate degree holders it's not everyone who is a dropout yes but the dj is mostly like an afterthought for a lot of people they do they try other things and later decide to um settle with um djing i don't know if i should and that. then that's their personal <laughs> um approach to life I guess. <laughs> yeah because I, I went to school. I, I was in the University of Ghana. But when I finished University of Ghana, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even do my national service. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I, I wanted to be a DJ. I finished school, so I'll be a DJ. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Okay. But people too, yeah, I understand why you say people, because mm -hmm. growing up, most of the DJs, I, well, we weren't calling them DJs, we were calling them spinners. <laughs> that we used to see in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and stuff looked like people who had any, or who don't have any educational yeah. background. But I think it was... Yeah, sometimes life makes you choose mm. certain things. Some too, maybe they had the passion to do it, not just so they feel, okay, if I can be a DJ, why bother going to school, school. before I become a DJ? Okay. So like I said, I, have, I know DJs who have very, very high academic mm. backgrounds, and I know some too who do not have any academic backgrounds. So okay. it depends on the individual. Well, let, let's come to the job market. How do you get your clients? I think with DJing, it's more about referrals and your, when people, sometimes people come to your events and then maybe after you're said, they are like, oh, can I get a card? Can I get a number? Okay. So you'll be there. You, sometimes you can, it can even be years. Mm. Then someone will call you and say, oh, I saw you on this day, blah, blah, blah. I'd like you to come in. So normally that's how it works. Mm. And then now we have the power of social media as well. Yeah. The more you post, I mean, you are putting your stuff online. So people have the freedom or the range mm -hmm. to just go check out the DJs. Maybe we want a DJ in our car, check out the DJs in our car. And then they will choose mm -hmm. their choice based on their own preference. So I think that has helped mm -hmm. as well. Social but media has really Yeah, really social media. I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that. Okay. But I think right now it's, it's more or less like a lot of people are on social media. Yes. Not all of us, but a lot of people are there. So if you are able to do your work and showcase to the people yes. via social media, everyone will see it. Yeah. And I think one thing I've realized with DJing is the more um, events or the more gigs you play or mm. you get, the more clients you get because i think people need you to be fresh in their minds like mm. they need to always remember you so if you are not doing anything at all people also look at it like okay then they are not doing the djing mm. again or they are on their... so it's like the more you do you the more you do the events the more you get booked for other events here yeah. i see how challenging can this job be it is it's very challenging because <laughs> <laughs> in being a dj i've been robbed twice I wow. had a car accident once because I was you, you mm. work at night a lot mm. and it's risky. It doesn't yeah. even depend on whether you're a man or a woman. It's risky. And I know most of my DJ colleagues have always spoken about mm. being robbed, going home at night and you know all those kind of things. But every job has its yeah. bad side. So if this it, this is ours, I mean it comes you deal with it and then you find another alternative. Mm. Do you mind sharing your your worst um experience in the game so far? Every time I think about this thing, I don't think I have a worse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have a worse, but what, whatever like reservations I've had mm. then for my DJing career had to do with if people were going to accept it as my my career path mm. or because like you said with the dropout thing i think way back, about three years ago someone texted me and from the tone of her message an old friend from school it mm. sounded like Things didn't go well for you, and then you chose to be a DJ. DJ. But sweetheart, I might be earning more than you are earning <laughs> with your office job. Yeah. So I need, I need life. Didn't nothing happen. Mm. This is what I want to do. It's yeah. me chasing my dreams. Yeah. Irrespective of whether in the society I am is being looked down upon or mm. not. So yeah, I think one of those things. And then you have family to think about. My family 
were were supportive for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Yes, they were supportive. It was my dad. I won't say he wasn't supportive, but he was just looking out for his child. Mm -hmm. Like you want to be a DJ as a female. Like even is it even worth it? Like to throw everything mm -hmm. away and be a DJ. That was his worry. So in the beginning, it looked like it's not. It's like Oof. when you talk about it or when he sees it, it's like okay, it's a face. You are going to get over it and then move on. But as time went on, he realized that okay, this is what she wants to do, and then. She's surviving perfectly mm. on it, so and now I think now he's like he's way cool about it than, yeah. For somebody who has the passion for DJ, and wants to start up, how what are some of the equipment that he or she needs to get to prepare okay. him, him or herself for so, the job? Market? Truth of the matter is, you can you can be a DJ with just your laptop, just your laptop, and then your um sound code i mean since the speakers already have it but wow. the thing is in every job there is there are skills there, yeah. is, there are upgrades when when i started out it was just me and my laptop but after i i oh let me say stages there are levels mm. when you finish with the laptop you feel like okay i can do better than what i have mm. done now so let me upgrade yeah. my software and my um my hardware as well so maybe you buy a turntable when i started on my turntable it was i don't even call it a turntable <laughs> it was a device it's, it was a small like you know the plastic ruler we use mm -hmm. and it was really really small and it was very like uh, it was very limited it was very limiting to mm -hmm. what i wanted to do as a dj it was just stuck to one software you couldn't do a lot mm -hmm. so when i had that one i felt like ah it's like I'm limiting myself. I can still do better. Mm -hmm. So it's like with every hardware I'm buying, it's better than the yeah. one I had before. Because mm -hmm. the more you grow, you also want to grow your skills and stuff. So that's basically it. But one problem with gadgets, even generally, it's not even just DJs, mm -hmm. it's difficult to get gadgets in a car. Okay. So when it comes to DJing, it's extra difficult. You Normally, have you have to buy everything outside and get someone to bring it to you or you ship it. And... So it's actually so one of my dreams yeah. to get like a flagship DJ store in a car very soon yeah. course, to make it easier for because I know a lot of DJs also complain about it like do I have to order everything if I want to mm -hmm. get it and then also because we have like lack of like we were saying about the school mm -hmm. there is no school like okay I want to you can learn from yeah primary from school basic, even yeah, university there's no one teaching you how mm. to be a dj so what i wanted to do personally was i didn't want people or let me say i didn't want females to go through the same things mm. i went through when i was starting out so there's this initiative my manager and i tried to put out but we haven't even started work on it because mm. when we thought of it that was when um, um the COVID started so mm. that was last year mm. so we couldn't even like start and then this year too we are we're not in the lockdown but we can't go yeah. out and stuff as much as before mm. so we are still waiting i just wanted to do um create like a community whereby we train young women who want to be DJs mm -hmm. and producers. Okay. Yeah, so we, I didn't even want to look at um, people in Accra and stuff because I feel in Accra things are pretty easier. Like you're exposed to a lot of things mm -hmm. other people in rural areas are not exposed to. But I will shock you, you go to a village and there's a girl there who wants to be a DJ. Yeah. Even though she doesn't know where to start <laughs> from. Yeah. So that's the plan to mm -hmm. like bridge the gap between young um, female DJs mm -hmm. and then I mean the job market so mm -hmm. we'll do we'll work on that one in mm -hmm. future very soon you mentioned that covid has really yeah. impacted your sector and i do hope that things get better yes. for you people to start getting your money and then all of that i know aside the, the challenges there are a whole lot of benefits that you enjoy being <laughs> a dj like you get into wear anything yes, at all. yes 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 tell me some of the benefits <laughs> <laughs> probably i'll change my mind about no my don't, change your mind. don't change your mind okay uh benefit benefit i mean if you're getting the gigs then there it means you're getting money mm. you're getting money so and money is always a motivation for everything so then there is money then sometimes there are free gifts i mean people give you stuff mm. just because okay you are the dj mm. and then what else what else what else <laughs> sometimes you have professional treatment to enter certain, certain places yeah. yeah it's pretty easy because i mean especially nightlife they know you oh, okay mm. that's the dj oh let them go let like mm. i mean there are so much more benefits but but DJ, you guys work, you even mentioned that you guys work hand in hand with producers, yes. with music producers. Yes. How, how do you guys work together? Wait, I think in that, in that um, regard has to do with those who are transitioning from, okay, they're not transitioning, they are just adding up. Okay. Like myself, I've been DJing for like eight years, but my, I don't even call it my first song. It was a feature I did um, 
an artist in Nigeria, her management reached out. They wanted me to do like a house music version of her song. Okay. So yeah, because I started producing fresh. Mm -hmm. I don't even have my own song out released yet. So they sent that and then I had to remix it and then it was released last mm -hmm. day in November. And DJs and producers have a lot of I don't call it similarities, but I mean even our gadgets and our gear is almost like the same so it's normally easy for a producer to switch being a dj and it's easy to for a dj to switch being a producer okay and i think now we've gotten to a part where most djs are producers on the side mm. and most producers too are djs on the side so I see. how do you deal with criticisms oh i think you know when people criticize you we have people who are criticizing you because they want you to be like the best version of yourself and then we have those who are just saying it because what you are doing even annoys them like so i mean when you criticize me and it makes sense like i feel like okay what you are saying actually i can apply to what i'm doing and be a better person i don't see why i should get offended mm. i'll listen to it and try to apply but that doesn't mean that anything everyone also tells you is the truth mm, the fact yeah. that you are criticizing me about this doesn't mean it's not working for me mm. if it's working for me the fact that you don't like it doesn't mean that it's bad yeah so yeah it depends on what kind of criticism it is and how it applies to what i'm doing and how i can use it to better myself mm -hmm. looking at the creative industry and as we are talking about djing looking at um, djing in the creative industry do you think djing is doing better or how do you see how do you think that yes i DJing think generally is generally it's doing way 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 better than before because i know it was um, at a particular time the only popular dj we all knew in accra mm. was dj black everyone was talking yeah. about dj black dj black <laughs> dj black but now there are a lot of like mm. yeah even younger ones who have come up and they are doing amazing things with their craft mm. so i think generally with djing in accra the the space has opened up there are more people looking forward to working mm. in that sector and i mean it's beautiful to watch because mm. yeah looking at it from then and then looking at it now it's it's a good what, thing what do you think can be done to improve the sector generally a creative arts industry needs to a lot of things needs to be done mm. generally not even just with the djs <laughs> and i feel when all those things are done mm. it will trickle it will trickle down it's always an ecosystem when the musicians are happy djs will be happy producers mm. will be happy and it works hand in hand so i can't even say for a fact that oh they should do this or they should do that but like you said with the school like this mm. i don't know maybe people, i think there are schools yeah but it should be more like it should be more forward it should be more front and center because i now i'm i've been thinking i'm trying to even remember one school does that i don't know maybe i haven't done my research mm. but off the top of my head i should be able to tell you one dj in school but yeah yeah it should be front and center we are not getting that so i think generally we need to like just open up the creative industry mm. check we have some few things to do that will make like our industry the best and when we do that i mean the djs too will also get their mm. due in that How, where do you see the industry in the next five to ten years well right now i think with the amount of creative work even coming out from mm -hmm. ghana and even africa as a whole it's beautiful to watch on like a few years back people are let me say going back to their roots mm. and bringing it back to the future so it's like you are you are focusing on your heritage all right but you are also giving it back to the current generation in such a way mm. that it's still appealing it's still fresh it's so i'm, I'm hoping it gets bigger bigger and better because the more bigger it gets the more everyone is happy yeah. everyone is getting paid and getting their due recognition so i hope in the next five ten years mm. we'll be way bigger than we are now female djs will be very normal right now if we have about 10 djs i, I need to see like about thousand <laughs> female djs we should yeah. make it feel like it's normal yeah. to be a dj yeah enough That's of the stereotypes mm. and stuff and i feel we'll be good to go there are some misconceptions about djing i mean this jockey the most common one is um the fact that it is not a serious job yeah what 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 do you what do you have <laughs> to say about that hmm it's not a serious job what does serious even mean? Is it because they don't wake up in the morning to go to work or... I feel every job is done to give you some sort of consideration. Yeah. You're doing it because of the money. You're doing it because you like it. Mm. So it might not be serious to you because you're not the one who's doing it. But yeah. I think it will be serious to the one. But that's what I'm saying. Where we are from, or where, yes, it's like being a DJ is... 
like we said, the school dropout mm. thing. So people <laughs> think it's not it's not relevant. It's not a right career choice or but career. We all can do the same thing. We all can be doctors. We all can be professors. If we are all doctors and we go to the party, who is going to play <laughs> the music? Somebody has to do yeah. it. So. Yeah, we, I don't think it's not serious. Yeah, the people look at it like it's a bit leisurely or mm. it's a bit free. Actually, it's not. It is it's not. It's not, yeah. Because <laughs> you have to prep before, then you have to go to the gig. That mm. I don't think there's... So yeah. you guys carry your stuff all, all around? All yes, yes, yes. In a case where the event already has the turntable, then mm. you are just going to take your laptop. But if they don't, then you have to carry your laptop and your turntable. Most of the time, oh. the gigs have speakers already, so you are just going with your turntable and your laptop. And then I must say that you are doing a very, very impressive <laughs> job. Yeah. You are doing a very impressive mm -hmm. what, what would you like to say to people who would want to do um, DJing as a career? Who would want to take DJing as oh, a career? They should go on. I mean, they should do it. They should do it. I, mm -hmm. I've seen my ups and I've seen my, my downs as well. And my, my up outweighs my down. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the most important thing. If you are doing something and you are not getting the results you need or the feedback you need. That means you are doing something wrong or it's not for you or it's just not going your way. But if you're doing it and it's going well, then I feel you should actually encourage more people to do it. They might not use the same um, method or process you used mm -hmm. in getting your results, but I feel everything is worth trying. So if you want to be a DJ, I feel you should go for it. Mm -hmm. Even though people say, <laughs> like you said, it's mm -hmm. not serious, yeah. but at the end of the day, you're getting your money, you're happy, mm -hmm. you're good to go. Thank you so much Thank for coming for on the show me. to share all of the insights um, of DJing as a career and everything. Thank, Thank you. you so much for making time. <laughs> you have been watching the CGC mm -hmm. show on AATV. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we discuss DJing as a career and our guest, uh, Michelle Yabwa, came to the studio to tell us all about DJing as a career. If you have any questions, any suggestions, you can send them via the WhatsApp number on your screen and also share them to with us on our social media platforms at a underscore tv on twitter association of african universities on facebook and youtube and at a tv official on instagram big thank you going now to gd makeover for my makeup and of course acousia collections gh for my outfit my name is aja omi and i have been your host i'll see you next time <laughs>
public cultural institutions and public scholarship in shaping African identities and society. Awards are open to all African postgraduate students in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. Applicants must be enrolled in a South African university's PhD program and working on topics relevant to ASIP's mission. Projects focusing on topics such as institutions of public culture, particular aspects of museums and exhibitions, forms and practices of public scholarship, as well as culture and communication will be sponsored. Interested applicants are to submit a completed cover sheet, abstract of the proposed research project, research proposal outlining the project's goals, central questions, significant and relevance for ASIP central concerns, curriculum vita, current transcript, and two reference letters as a single file via ASIP.uwc at gmail.com with the heading ASIP 2021 Research Award Publication before 3rd May 2021. Visit www.graduateschool.emory.edu for more information. Le programme africain d'enquête critique est heureux d'annoncer les Yvon Cap Doctoral Research Awards 2021 pour soutenir les étudiants africains diplômés en sciences humaines et sociales humanistes qui étudient dans les universités sud-africaines et travaillent sur les études de thèse connexes. Ce programme vise à promouvoir la discussion et l'enquête sur les positions et les pratiques de culture publique, des institutions culturelles publiques et des bourses publiques pour façonner les identités africaines et la société. Les prix sont ouverts à tous les étudiants africains de troisième cycle en sciences humaines et sociales humanistes. Les candidats doivent être inscrits au doctorat d'une université sud-africaine. Programme et travail sur les sujets pertinents pour la mission de la ACIP. Des projets axés sur des sujets tels que les institutions de la culture publique, des aspects particuliers, des musées et des expositions, des formes et des pratiques d'érudition publique, ainsi que la culture et la communication seront parrainés. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre une feuille de couverture remplie, résumé du projet de recherche proposé, proposition de recherche décrivant les objectifs du projet, questions centrales, signification et pertinence pour les préoccupations centrales de la ACIP. Curriculum vita, transcription actuelle et deux lettres de référence en un seul fichier via asip.uwc.gmail.com avec la rubrique demande de prix de recherche ACIP 2021 avant le 3 mai 2021. Visitez le www.graduateschool.imori.edu pour plus d'informations. The Association of African Universities is pleased to announce a call for nominations from members of the Association for the positions of President, Vice President and members of the Governing Board to serve for the period 2021 to 2025. Members of the Association in good standing who are duly qualified candidates are invited to make nominations for election by completing the online form via the link on the screen before 20th June 2021. Interested candidates should kindly refer to the rules and general conditions in accordance with the AAU bylaws as well as all other relevant information via the link provided on the screen. L'Association des universités africaines est priée d'annoncer un appel à candidature de membres de l'association pour les postes de président, vice-président et membres du conseil d'administration pour la période 2021-2025. Les membres en règle de l'association, qui sont des candidats d'hommes qualifiés, sont invités à faire des nominations pour l'élection en remplissant le formulaire en ligne via le lien à l'écran avant le 20 juin 2021. Les candidats intéressés doivent se référer avec bonté aux règles et conditions générales conformément aux bailleurs de l'AUA 
ainsi qu'à toutes les autres informations pertinentes via le lien fourni à l'écran. The Africa Higher Education Research Institute, AHERI, is pleased to present to you Fireside Chat, a conversation on the pandemic and its effects on internship programs in Kenyan higher education institutions. AHERI focuses on research through conferences, colloquia, and high-level discussions with a view of making higher education relevant to sustainable development in Africa. This chat will provide platforms for presenters and discussants to clarify the opportunities the pandemic has offered to remedy the previous challenges or restructure the industrial attachment. For more inquiries, email info at aheri.org or call plus 254 2020 L'Institut Africain de Recherche sur l'Enseignement Supérieur est heureux de vous présenter un chat côté feu, une conversation sur la pandémie et ses effets sur les programmes de stage dans les établissements d'enseignement supérieur kenya. Hariri se concentre sur la recherche à travers des conférences en vue de rendre l'enseignement supérieur pertinent pour le développement durable en Afrique. L'Institut le fait en accueillant des conférences des colloques et des discussions de haut niveau. Ce chat fournira des plateformes aux présentateurs et aux intervenants pour clarifier les opportunités que la pandémie a offertes pour remédier aux défis précédents ou restructurer l'attachement industriel. Pour plus de demandes, envoyez un courrier à info.aéry.com .org ou appelez le 254 le 20 20 47 216. Applications for the World Bank Robert McNamara Fellowship Program, RSMFP, is open to inspire development economics researchers from developing countries with World Bank research economists, creating unique opportunities for the fellows to participate in rigorous policy relevant research. Applicants will have a unique opportunity to widen their perspective on potential development questions and how their research can address challenges in a developing country. To be eligible, applicants must be nationals of World Bank Group member countries, graduates of MA level studies, not more than 35 years of age, and must be available to relocate to Washington, D.C. for the duration of the fellowship. Interested applicants should submit a resume statements of papers in PDF file, contacts of at least one academic reference and writing sample. The application is open till 30th April 2021. And for more information, email rsm underscore fellowships at worldbank.org. Les candidatures au programme de bourse Robert MC Namara de la Banque mondiale sont ouvertes pour inspirer les chercheurs en économie du développement des pays en développement, les économistes de la recherche de la Banque mondiale créant des opportunités uniques pour les boursiers de participer à des recherches rigoureuses, pertinentes pour les politiques. Les candidats auront une occasion unique d'élargir le point de vue sur les questions de développement potentiel et comment leurs recherches peuvent relever les défis dans le monde en développement. Pour être éligibles, les candidats doivent être des ressortissants des pays membres du GBM de la Banque mondiale, des diplômés des études de niveau MA, âgés de plus de 35 ans, et doivent être disponibles pour déménager à Washington DC pendant la durée de la bourse. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre une curriculum vita, une déclaration d'intention dans un fichier PDF, un contact avec au moins d'une référence académique et un échantillon écrit. L'application est ouverte jusqu'au 30 avril 2021 et pour plus d'informations par email, envoyez à rsmfellowship.org. The Covenant University CAPEC is, in partnership with INRIA French National Research Institute for Digital Sciences and Ace Impact DSTN, with the support of Agence Française de Développement AFD, 
It's inviting you to their two weeks workshop on higher performance computing, basics and intermediates, scheduled from 17th May to 28th May 2021. The aim of this workshop is to introduce system in administrators who are currently responsible for high performance computing infrastructure in their various research higher education institutions to the most cutting edge HPC technologies. All system administrators in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to apply and, and must complete the application form via the link on the screen. Email ace at covenantuniversity.edu.ng or visit www.aids.covenantuniversity.edu.ng slash workshop for more information. Covenant University, en partenariat avec ERIA, Institut National de Recherche en Sciences Numériques et AIDS Impact, la DSTN, avec le soutien de l'Agence Française de Développement, vous invite à leur atelier de deux semaines sur le calcul haute performance, base et intermédiaire du 7 mai au 28 mai 2021. L'objectif de cet atelier est d'introduire des administrateurs systèmes qui sont actuellement responsables de l'infrastructure de calcul haute performance dans leurs divers établissements de recherche, enseignement supérieur aux technologies, la HPC les plus avancées. Tous les administrateurs systèmes au Nigeria et en Afrique subsaharienne doivent postuler et doivent remplir le formulaire de demande via la liaison à l'écran et aussi envoyer un courriel à as.covenantuniversity.edu.ng ou encore visiter le www.as.covenantuniversity.edu.ng bar workshop pour plus d'informations. Thank you for being with us. Events update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAE TV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAE TV official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org. I am Isabella Tetanyenapa. Je suis Imelda Amoudi. I'm here with the Association of African Universities Television, AUTV. I just want to say that uh, without the media, you won't know what's going on in the world. Even with the media, you sometimes don't know what's going on in the world. So you need to tune in to the reliable sources who are really on the front lines, who can give you the information you need and give you facts, uh, not conjecture, give you real news, not fake news. And this is the place to find it, AUTV. The voice of higher education in Africa. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is an international non-governmental organization set up by universities in Africa to promote cooperation among themselves and the international academic community. Uh, my name is Professor Etienne Ewan Eile. Je suis le secrétaire général de l'Association des universités africaines qui est basée à Accra, au Ghana. Euh, je vais vous parler de la création de l'Association des universités africaines. Euh, il faut remonter dans les années 60 pour pouvoir comprendre le processus. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. I am not Lamini, I'm the director of ICT Services and Knowledge Management at the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities is a network of 400 universities in Africa. The biggest value that the universities benefit from being members of the association is this big platform that allows them to collaborate, allows them to work together, allows them to teach together. 
through this platform a university in North Africa can work with the university in Southern Africa and also those in East Africa can work with those in West Africa. Founded November 1967 at a conference in Rabat, Morocco by heads of African higher education institutions, the association is currently headquartered in Accra, Ghana. My name is Maxwell Amohoit. I'm the director of finance of the Association of African Universities. The association sustains itself from contributions from member universities and also from other development partners. Some of our development partners include the World Bank, other governmental agencies like the Swedish International Development Agency, UK Department for International uh, Development and other partners. We also receive a lot of support from other governments, especially the government of Ghana. Other partners include the African Union, which is more or less the parent organization of the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities hosts the Secretariat for the uh, African Union's Continental Education Strategy. And by so doing, we provide coordinating roles for the African Union in helping members achieve their targets. Déjà uh, 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Et rappelons-nous que les années 60, la décade 60, a été une décade où la plupart des pays africains ont obtenu leur indépendance ou ont, euh, disons, pris les dispositions pour être indépendants. C'était donc aussi l'année de développement, dans la mesure où tous ces pays indépendants devaient se retrouver de temps en temps pour parler de comment mettre ensemble leurs problèmes et trouver une solution commune à leurs problèmes. Et dans ce contexte-là, l'éducation était une priorité pour eux. Surtout l'éducation universitaire. Et sur ce plan-là, les universités aussi se sont organisées grâce à l'UNESCO qui a parrainé plusieurs réunions depuis euh, Madagascar jusqu'au Maroc. My name is Jonathan Umba. I'm the director of research and academic planning. The programs and projects that we run at AAU are consistent with our strategic plan and they are implemented for our higher education stakeholders, namely the higher uh, education institutions in Africa. These programs are implemented in such a way that our stakeholders will get the benefit of membership of our association. And our programs also are aligned with uh, a number of uh, global and uh, international agendas on higher education, including the Continental Education Strategy for Africa and the Agenda 2063. So these programs are aligned with uh, a number of uh, international agendas with a view to promoting higher education in Africa. The AAU is the apex organization and principal forum for consultation, exchange of information, and cooperation among universities in Africa. I am Professor Nkusa Mahao, Vice Chancellor of the National University of Lesotho in the Kingdom of Lesotho in Southern Africa. There are roughly uh, 77 universities that uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you might be aware, there are a lot more universities uh, that are as yet to take the membership of the Association of African Universities. Well, universities that are not members of the AAU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent. The agenda of the African Union 
2063. So if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training uh, human resource capital, training their own staff and students, um, the opportunities uh, that are provided by uh, the universalization of quality management uh, on higher education uh, on the continent, um, and many other opportunities that are provided. Et en 1963, il y a eu une réunion à Khartoum, au Soudan, où les chefs des institutions d'enseignement supérieur ont décidé de créer euh, l'Association des universités africaines. Finalement, la création va se faire à une conférence qui s'est tenue à Rabat au Maroc et la création de l'Association des universités africaines a eu lieu le 12 novembre 1967. Je suis uh, Hassan Kafi, uh, AAU Governing Board Member, représentant pour East African Region. Je suis le président de Plasma University. Mogadishu, Somalia. We really like to give a call for universities in in Africa, especially in East Africa, those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities. Uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours. It represents the voice of higher education in Africa being seen all over the world. Hello and welcome to AAU TV on Diaspora Connect. Uh, we had an interesting conversation uh, with Dr. Daniel Wuba, the president of Melesvo University on collaboration with African universities. They say an interesting conversation is the one that never ends. So obviously the conversation with Melesvo University will never end and we will seek to prove further on some of the interventions that are really helping uh, education uh, in Africa. So, Dr. Uba, uh, welcome again to our interaction on AAU TV. Thank you very much, Snyder. All right, since this is a, a continuation of our earlier uh, interaction, uh, we, there wouldn't be any need for introduction. Uh, we will go in straight to our topic for today, and we are looking at connecting undergraduate students from the U.S. and Ghana through U.S. National Science Foundation undergraduate research grants. Doc, please tell us the rationale and what goes into this particular research fund. Okay. Uh, thank you once again um, for inviting me to this program. And um, I'm always thrilled to talk about um, the National Science Foundation undergraduate. We call it the Research Experiences for Undergraduate Sites Program. And just to give you a background of how the program developed in Ghana, how I set it up, um, as a faculty member, I had a lab with about 10 students every semester, and I worked with just my students. 
But then during the summers, there were students who needed additional research experience. So when I became department head at Towson, I started looking for opportunities to create a culture of research for the entire department. And that is when we went to the National Science Foundation to look for resources to support an undergraduate research program across the department. That is the REU site. The purpose of REU site is you write a competitive proposal, you are then reviewed, you know, normally NSF gets about, you know, 100 proposals for each discipline. They review it and they can award maybe up to 10, you know, awards every summer. So I ended up, you know, fortunately enough, being able to get one of those grants for my department as a, and the department head in biology. Um, I did that for three years. So that was what I would call the domestic NSF REU program. So I did that for three years. And then when I became an associate dean, I didn't give up my research. So during the summers, I spent time in the lab with students doing research under the National Science Foundation program. But I realized that I was being interrupted. At times, I would be in the office working on something, and then I'll be interrupted to go back to the lab to work with students. So I started thinking about how can I develop a program where I can build on my own experiences and opportunities that I have to enrich the students' you know, experiences in research. And that's when you know, the light went on, the light bulb went on. And I said, you know what? I grew up in Ghana. I have connections in Ghana. What if I can take students to Ghana to do research? And I know that there's so much that students can learn in Ghana. Okay? But if you know, I can do that, then it means I will be away from my office. So there's a kind of a selfish element in, in there. Yeah, yeah. But I can get to spend time with students in Ghana focusing on research. That is when I approached the National Science Foundation to ask if I can replicate the programs that I had been doing here, but at an international site in Ghana. And I found out that they had already been doing it in Europe, that's in France, in the UK, that's American students going to do this kind of research there, and even some Asian countries, but not in Africa. So it had never been taking place in Africa. And so when I reached out to some of my uh, friends, actually uh, one of my uh, former uh, collaborators at the University of Cape Coast, that what if I can bring American students to Cape Coast for eight weeks in the summer to do research. And the major goals of the project were as follows, to provide the students a first-hand international research experience in a developing country. Secondly, I wanted to improve their lifelong skills, such as critical thinking, creativity, problem solving, and also reasoning and interpersonal skills in terms of their cultural awareness. Thirdly, I wanted also to emphasize the importance of global collaboration and cooperation to address problems. And finally, I wanted to immerse the American students in the Ghanaian society during their stay okay. so that they would have a better understanding and appreciation of sub-Saharan culture. Okay. These were my four main goals for the program. And okay. Um, it's so far, I would say, if you ask me about one of my, the crowning achievements of my career, this program has been one of those because awesome. we've been able to put 108 students through that program and I know where each and every student is at the moment. Okay, so let's track uh, this, if I understand. This is a collaboration where you bring students from the United States to do their research in Africa, yes? Yes. Um, so in, in that arrangement, um, if we're talking about ownership, or let me say the outcomes of this research, does it have an impact on Africa? Or it is something that the student, let's say the students come here, the research is of relevance to the United States or is of relevance to Africa. How does that research bit go? Like, how does it work? Is it a research on problems in Africa? or a research from the United States that benefits the United States? Um, the best way to you know, explain the uh, program is that students apply, the point we advertise the program here, students apply to the program, and then we match them with faculty mentors in Ghana. The students start the discussing 
the potential pro you know, projects they will work on with their faculty mentors in Ghana. So the projects that are, we finally work on comes as a result of mutual discussion between the faculty member and the students. And invariably, these are projects that are based in Ghana, in the African country. Okay. So then the benefits would also be for you know, uh, the uh, continent, that's for uh, the faculty member there. Now, let me give you an example. Um, I can give you a list of some of these projects, but one of them was identification of different taxa of you know, butterflies. During the first time that I brought students to Ghana to do this project, the faculty member who is an entomologist had been working on finding new butterflies that are involved in pollination of some you know, cash crops at Cape Coast. Okay. But for a long time, he hadn't been as successful as he wanted to uh, work on this project. So working with this um, American student, they came up with a new protocol for basically trapping the uh, butterflies and then doing the identification. Can you believe that over the eight week period, they were able to identify five new in, uh, butterflies that no one had ever seen before. And they were at the Kakum forest. Okay. In this case, the benefit is not only for the Ghanaians, but it's also for science as a whole. So the American student benefit, benefited from learning how to you know, basically work in the African context, but also came up with knowledge in entomology that didn't pre-exist you know, when this program started. So ultimately, as a scientist, the work that you do shouldn't benefit you know, one country or the other, but it should benefit all the participants, ultimately, you know, the whole field of science. So that is just an example of, you know, the projects that and the students were doing. And as I said, we ran it for 15 years. So we've done re uh, projects, you know, spanning from, you know, coastal ecology, fisheries, taxon taxonomy, environmental biology, conservation biology, and entomology. Okay. So if, 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 because you're talking about, um, uh, like you mentioned, a lot of coastal uh, issues, especially the entomology, coastal, is it coastal entomology? So do you have, is it a collaboration with specific departments or this is a collaboration with the university uh, in general? Well, uh, the REU program was based in the Faculty of Science at the University of Cape Coast. So the collaboration was specifically with three departments, okay? Department of Wildlife, Department of Aquaculture, and the Department of Chemistry. Those were the three departments that the students were placed. And each student had a faculty mentor, and they had a defined project that they work on over the summer. Now, um, this is an opportunity to actually give you the details of how the program ran. Okay. Students were admitted here to the host institution, you know, as I said earlier, I've been at five universities. So depending on the university at which I was, students when admitted will come to the host institution. Okay. We spent the first three days basically preparing them to come to Ghana. Okay. So, you know, and my wife will cook Ghanaian food for them to get a taste of that. You know, we watch, you know, videos about previous years' experiences or about Ghanaian culture. Okay. And then we travel together to Ghana. When we get to University of Cape Coast, we use the first two days as orientation. That's on site. We do the you know pre-travel orientation at my home institution here. Then we do the on-site orientation at University of Cape Coast. After that occurs, the student will start you know their project. Let me give you a typical week. What happens from Monday through Friday? Students are focused on their research work. That meaning working in the lab or out there in the field collecting data. Okay. But on Wednesdays in the afternoons, we have a two hour block where the students actually take part in the seminar presented by faculty members in the sciences from University of Cape Coast. So they get to see the diversity, the variations in terms of different you know, projects going on at the University of Cape Coast in the, science, in the, in the uh, faculty of science. Then on Fridays in the mornings, we have a seminar, two hour seminar on what we call Ghanaian culture. So we have faculty members who come to talk about the importance of festivals, 
Okay, they talk about you know the importance of music in Ghanaian culture. It's not only for entertainment; it can use to communicate. So you know they get that in-depth experience of science in Africa, in addition to you know the Ghanaian culture, and this is then wrapped around the scientific experiments that they do. Okay. At the end of the program, they actually make a presentation to the entire campus. It's open to the entire university campus to you know come and listen to the project that they work on, okay, and ask them questions about it. One of the outcomes, I know, you know, this will probably be coming up soon, is students who take part in this project, because it is fully funded by the National Science Foundation, they get everything covered. Okay. Round trip airfare, meals, accommodation, research supplies, and I give them a stipend. Okay. Okay. So everything is covered for them. And at the end of the program, they have to submit to me a report in the form of a manuscript that can be published in peer-reviewed journals. And I'm very glad to say that we've published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles through this program. Oh, good. All right. So that is quite interesting. And I think you mentioned uh, a, a portion because I was interested in knowing, and of course my viewers will be interested in knowing what actually the fund covers, which you did well to mention some of them, because one obvious challenge I was looking at is uh, research infrastructure. You know, that is one of the challenges we have in our universities in Africa. So if you are bringing students to conduct research in an entirely new environment where infrastructure is key, how do you mitigate such challenges? Actually, you can also add some of the challenges that you've encountered so far in this program and how you are mitigating them. Okay. Um, I think one of the beauty of this program was like that for most of the students who you know, participated in it, they had already done some research in the U.S. where there's a plethora of equipment in the labs, in the state-of-the-art equipment. But when coming, I often tell them that they are going to use the most sophisticated equipment, which is their brain. Okay. Because they are not going to get all these sophisticated equipment we have here. And I'll give you an example of a situation in which, you know, a student coming to Ghana at that time, you know, he had the impression that most people in Ghana didn't know much about AIDS. This is, you know, long, you know. So he said, oh, I'm going to, his goal was to understand, you know, how well known, you know, people uh, were aware of, you know, um, AIDS in terms of its um, distribution and prevalence. So he designed this project with the intention of looking for information centers and then interviewing, you know, Ghanaians within a certain radius, you know, several concentric radio, radii, and then use that to determine their knowledge. We got to Ghana, okay, and he thought that if he walks on the street and asks someone, you know, tell me about it, they wouldn't know about it. In his pre-survey, he came back that evening after doing the survey and he said, Dr. Uwe, I think you know, my project is not going to work because I was going to do qualitative, you know, quantitative analysis, ask people questions and then just check, this person doesn't know, this person knows it. Okay. But after talking to people, everybody knew about AIDS in Ghana, actually in Cape Coast. So he said, do I have to go back to the state without a project? I said, no. We met with the faculty mentor and we switch the focus from quantitative analysis of information on AIDS to qualitative analysis. So we developed an entirely new instrument that he used for his survey. Okay. Now, this is an example of the benefit that you know, being in Ghana provided. He wouldn't have gotten that benefit here. With regards to specifically instrumentation, as part of the, pro and the program, we normally almost every other year bring some small equipment that we could carry with us. You know, we couldn't ship large equipment, but for example, some of the equipment we use in the lab, you know, some uh, scales as well as, you know, and that's Geiger counters, we bring all of those things to Ghana okay, okay. with us when we come to Ghana. So, and we leave these equipment instruments at the, you know, at the University of Cape Coast, we never brought them back to the States. Okay. They benefit, you know, the uh, departments benefited from that. Another way by which we actually helped, you know, uh, that this program has actually helped some and uh, that department is at the University of Cape Coast, as a result of this program, we actually brought a faculty member when I was at James Madison who spent a year 
doing postdoctoral work in our chemistry department. When going back, he took several equipments with him back to Ghana. Okay. So that is one of the benefits, you know, it's unintended benefits of the program. Okay. All right. So this is, this is perfect. And I think the collaboration exposes uh, your students uh, in the United States. Likewise, the students who are here that they get the opportunity to interact with and then those they get the opportunity to work on researches with. Going forward, I know the scope of this project has been defined especially uh, with the choice of universities to, col to collaborate with. So over here we've mentioned the University of Cape Coast. Is there a place for the project, in the project, for expansion to other universities? And also, you know, we've talked about, uh, I think, uh, the, 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 the fact that you bring students here. Is there a way that in the project is structured that when the students come here, they have uh, research partners in, uh, let's say, Ghana. So before they even come to Ghana, they are already working on something with a partner uh, student in Ghana so that when they come, it's like a continuation of what they started so that the experience is not for only the students in the United States, but also for students in University of Cape Coast or a partner university. Well, actually, there are two ways that you know, we've used to address this particular question. Because of the application cycle, you know, for students to take part in the summer program, most of the students apply in the fall here. We admit them in early spring. So then from February through May, before they come, that's when the students actually reach out to the faculty mentors in Ghana. Okay. That their initial interactions are often with the faculty mentor. But in Every instance that we've had students at the University of Cape Coast, the faculty members already have students in their labs who are also doing research. So okay. they always give them partners. There are times when they have multiple partners when they get to you know, the uh, University of Cape Coast. And so that has been well established within the program. Okay. So that is one way by which you know, students, that the Ghanaian students can also benefit. They end up developing relationships um, with the American students. And I know there have been instances where as a result of working with the, um, that the American um, students, they've been able to follow up past the program to come to do graduate studies in this country. Okay, that's one. The second uh, uh, effort that uh, I have in mind, but it hasn't really materialized, is to get USAID funds that can be used to support Ghanaian students while they are there. At the moment, okay. uh, one of the biggest benefits, I think, apart from the intellectual you know, development that takes place and the research findings is I do pay the faculty members, you know, when I did the program, they were paid over the summer. They actually received stipends for mentoring the students. And some of the Ghanaian students also got stipends, you know, through their faculty men mentors there, you know, to cover their costs during the summer. So there is a win-win, you know, situation okay. here. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Let's take a breather here and then uh, get a glass of water and then we will continue our discussion. Welcome back. This is AAU TV and this is Diaspora Connect. On today's show, we are talking about the U.S. National Science Foundation Undergraduate uh, Research Grants that is being spearheaded by Dr. Uh, Buddha. Dr. Wuba, Daniel A. Wuba, who is the president of Mellesville University in the United States. Uh, Doc, uh, before we left off, we had talked intensively on the program and what it seeks to do and some of the achievements so far. Now, let's continue our discussion. Over here, I'm looking at the sustainability of this particular project. This is a funded program and mostly this is supposed to have a lifespan, yes? If so, how do you intend to sustain this program beyond the funding period? Well, actually, uh, the program ran from 2002 to 2016. As we speak now, I'm no more running the program. 
But the National Science Foundation research, you know, uh, experiences for undergraduates program is still available to anyone who wants to apply to set up that program. And I'm working with our faculty members in the biology department here to write, you know, one of um, the proposals so that we can reactivate it at Millersville University. Okay. So that is one way by which, you know, it can continue. But I know that several REU programs now are occurring across the continent. In 2002, when I started it, it was the first one in sub-Saharan Africa. There was no REU program there at that time. At least in Ghana, I've heard about two other faculty members here who are now running programs through the NSF REU sites program. So it can definitely be sustained if you have faculty members, you know, with an interest in making it happen. All right. Thank you very much, Doc. I think this has been an interesting discussion. Um, we will go to your final words, but then before we go there, uh, this whole funding, uh, the, this whole funding for this research grant is, it's like a one way where, you know, students come from the West to universities in Africa, specifically Ghana. Is there a space for the opposite movement of students also from Ghana to the United States so that they get the same experiences, the same exposure as the original uh, project? Yes, I would say at the moment uh, when this program started, you know, by the third year, we started thinking about ways by which we can provide opportunities for the Ghanaian students to come to the U.S. And talking to the National Science Foundation, it was very clear that we couldn't use the U.S. funds from the NSF to support the foreign students. But USAID has a bunch of programs that will support foreign students to come to this country. So we started working on that kind of partnership. I know that currently the program exists that when you get an NSF REU site international program, such as the one I described, you can use it as a leverage to apply to the USAID to okay. provide funding for the Ghanaian students to come to the US to do you know, research projects. Okay. But it all depends on a number of factors. The program should be structured in such a way that you have faculty members in the US okay. who would be able to host the students so that depends on institutional partnerships. That is how you can develop you know, this kind of program. Okay. Okay. But uh, before we wrap up, let me also mention the impact is not only on students, but faculty members also benefited. I, you know, I mentioned the stipends that the faculty members back in Ghana received. But also, in addition to that, I was able to bring Ghanaian faculty members to my host institutions here. Um, Dr. Opoku Bwama uh, at University of Cape Coast came to James Madison for a whole year through this program. Secondly, uh, I brought Professor Yangsin at that time to be a keynote speaker at you know, a conference on pedagogy. And it was all built on this kind of, you know, the REU side program made it possible to, uh, for that to happen. So the benefit actually goes beyond just students, American students getting experiences in Ghana. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Uba. So in your wrap up, um, what advice would you also give to other faculty members in the diaspora? Because if you look at what you've done as an individual for the continent, especially your contribution to education in Ghana, what advice would you give to your colleagues? Thank you very much, Snyder, for that question. I think, you know, I, I'm not special in any way. It just comes from an interest and a commitment to make a difference. And I would suggest to that that's Africans in the diaspora, especially in higher education, to look for opportunities to partner with our colleagues who are on the African continent. And in this case, they should look at it as a situation in which it will be mutually beneficial, not only to the Africans, but also to you know, wherever they may be, because the richness of not only our culture, but also the environment in Africa 
okay? And the systems in Africa, it's like that the only way we can let others know is to take people to Africa, to learn about Africa in Africa. Okay. I think that is the driving force. No matter where you are, if you have an origin from Africa, you can go back and expose others to it. And that is a driving force, giving back. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Uba. So I don't know if you have any final words, final, final words before uh, we leave. Uh, that would be much appreciated, especially, uh, uh, let me say, in relation to the summary of everything that we've discussed today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ankuma. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to get a chance to interact with um, up-and-coming leaders like yourself, you know, in Africa, specifically in Ghana. And I currently believe that the future of this planet runs through Africa. And it's up to us to really position ourselves, train the next generation of, you know, the citizenry, and the labor force that would enhance the lives of everyone on this planet okay. and it comes through africa anyone who has an interest can definitely find a way to collaborate with africans thank you thank you very much the, the interesting line that i take from our discussion is the future of the world runs through africa and indeed africa is the hope for the world because of our immense human resource which makes us the beacon of hope thank you very much for being with us i was your host for today's session Snada kweku ankuma Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, KinoFlow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. Welcome to Event Update on AAE TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update is all about information on upcoming higher education events and scholarship opportunities in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. My name is Isabella Tetahinakwa. What's the email that Amuji? African Critical Inquiry Program, ASIP, is pleased to announce the Ivan Cap Doctoral Research Awards 2021 to support African graduate students in the humanities and humanistic social sciences who are studying at South African universities and working on related dissertation studies. This program aims to promote discussion and inquiry into the positions and practices of 
public culture, public cultural institutions, and public scholarship in shaping African identities and society. Awards are open to all African postgraduate students in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. Applicants must be enrolled in a South African university's PhD program and working on topics relevant to ASIP's mission. Projects focusing on topics such as institutions of public culture, particular aspects of museums and exhibitions, forms and practices of public scholarship, as well as culture and communication will be sponsored. Interested applicants are to submit a completed cover sheet, abstract of the proposed research project, research proposal outlining the project goals, central questions, significant and relevant for ASIP central concerns, curriculum vita, current transcripts, and two reference letters as a single file via ASIP.uwc at gmail.com with the heading ASIP 2021 Research Award Publication before 3rd May 2021. Visit www.graduateschool.elmory.edu for more information. Le programme africain d'enquête critique est heureux d'annoncer les Ivo Cap Doctoral Research Awards 2021 pour soutenir les étudiants africains diplômés en sciences humaines et sociales humanistes qui étudient dans les universités sud-africaines et travaillent sur les études de thèse connexes. Ce programme vise à promouvoir la discussion et l'enquête sur les positions et les pratiques de culture publique, des institutions culturelles publiques et des bourses publiques pour façonner les identités africaines et la société. Les prix sont ouverts à tous les étudiants africains de troisième cycle en sciences humaines et sociales humanistes. Les candidats doivent être inscrits au doctorat d'une université sud-africaine. Programme et travail sur les sujets pertinents pour la mission de la ACIP. Des projets axés sur des sujets tels que les institutions de la culture publique, des aspects particuliers, des musées et des expositions, des formes et des pratiques d'érudition publique, ainsi que la culture et la communication seront parrainés. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre une feuille de couverture remplie, résumé du projet de recherche proposé, proposition de recherche décrivant les objectifs du projet, questions centrales, signification et pertinence pour les préoccupations centrales de la ACIP. Curriculum vita, transcription actuelle et deux lettres de référence en un seul fichier via asip.uwc.gmail.com avec la rubrique demande de prix de recherche ASIP 2021 avant le 3 mai 2021. Visitez le www.graduateschool.imori.edu pour plus d'informations. The Association of African Universities is pleased to announce a call for nominations from members of the Association for the positions of President, Vice President and members of the Governing Board to serve for the period 2021 to 2025. Members of the Association in good standing who are duly qualified candidates are invited to make nominations for election by completing the online form via the link on the screen before 20th June 2021. Interested candidates should kindly refer to the rules and general conditions in accordance with the AAU bylaws as well as all other relevant information via the link provided on the screen. L'Association des universités africaines est priée d'annoncer un appel à candidature de membres de l'association pour les postes de président, vice-président et membres du conseil d'administration pour la période 2021-2025. Les membres en règle de l'association, qui sont des candidats d'une qualifiés, sont invités à faire des nominations pour l'élection en remplissant le formulaire en ligne via le lien à l'écran avant le 20 juin 2021. Les candidats intéressés doivent se référer avec bonté aux règles et conditions générales conformément aux bail lors de l'AUA 
ainsi qu'à toutes les autres informations pertinentes via le lien fourni à l'écran. The Africa Higher Education Research Institute, AHERI, is pleased to present to you Fireside Chat, a conversation on the pandemic and its effect on internship programs in Kenyan higher education institutions. AHERI focuses on research through conferences, colloquia, and high-level discussions with a view of making higher education relevant to sustainable development in Africa. This chat will provide platforms for presenters and discussants to clarify the opportunities the pandemic has offered to remedy the previous challenges or restructure the industrial attachment. For more inquiries, email info at aheri.org or call plus 254 2020 L'Institut africain de recherche sur l'enseignement supérieur est heureux de vous présenter un chat côté feu, une conversation sur la pandémie et ses effets sur les programmes de stage dans les établissements d'enseignement supérieur kenyan. Ariri se concentre sur la recherche à travers des conférences en vue de rendre l'enseignement supérieur pertinent pour le développement durable en Afrique. L'Institut le fait en accueillant des conférences des colloques et des discussions de haut niveau. Ce chat fournira des plateformes aux présentateurs et aux intervenants pour clarifier les opportunités que la pandémie a offertes pour remédier aux défis précédents ou restructurer l'attachement industriel. Pour plus de demandes, envoyez un courrier à info.aerie.com Org, ou appeler le 254 le 20 20 47 216. Applications for the World Bank Robert McNamara Fellowship Program, RSMFP, is open to inspire development economics researchers from developing countries with World Bank research economists, creating unique opportunities for the fellows to participate in rigorous policy relevant research. Applicants will have a unique opportunity to widen their perspective on potential development questions and how their research can address challenges in a developing country. To be eligible, applicants must be nationals of World Bank Group member countries, graduates of MA level studies, not more than 35 years of age, and must be available to relocate to Washington, D.C. for the duration of the fellowship. Interested applicants should submit a resume Statement of purpose in PDF file, contacts of at least one academic reference and writing sample. The application is open till 30th April 2021. And for more information, email rsm underscore fellowships at worldbank.org. Les candidatures au programme de bourse Robert MC Namara de la Banque mondiale sont ouvertes pour inspirer les chercheurs en économie du développement des pays en développement, des économistes de la recherche de la Banque mondiale, créant des opportunités uniques pour les boursiers de participer à des recherches rigoureuses, pertinentes pour les politiques. Les candidats auront une occasion unique d'élargir le point de vue sur les questions de développement potentiel et comment leurs recherches peuvent relever les défis dans le monde en développement. Pour être éligibles, les candidats doivent être des ressortissants des pays membres du GBM de la Banque mondiale, des diplômés des études de niveau MA, âgés de plus de 35 ans, et doivent être disponibles pour déménager à Washington DC pendant la durée de la bourse. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre une curriculum vita, une déclaration d'intention dans un fichier PDF, un contact avec au moins d'une référence académique et un échantillon écrit. L'application est ouverte jusqu'au 30 avril 2021 et pour plus d'informations par email, envoyez à rsmfellowship.org. 
The Covenant University Capfic Ace, in partnership with INRIA French National Research Institute for Digital Sciences and Ace Impact DSTN, with the support of Agence Francaise de Développement AFD, is inviting you to their two weeks workshop on higher performance computing, basics, and intermediates, scheduled from 17th May to 28th May 2021. The aim of this workshop is to introduce system administrators who are currently responsible for high-performance computing infrastructure in their various research higher education institutions to the most cutting-edge HPC technologies. All system administrators in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to apply and, and must complete the application form via the link on the screen. Email is at covenantuniversity.edu.ng or visit www.aids.covenantuniversity.edu.ng slash workshop for more information. Covenant University, en partenariat avec ERIA, Institut National de Recherche en Sciences Numériques et AIDS Impact, la DSTN, avec le soutien de l'Agence Française de Développement vous invite à leur atelier de deux semaines sur le calcul haute performance, base et intermédiaire du 7 mai au 28 mai 2021. L'objectif de cet atelier est d'introduire des administrateurs système qui sont actuellement responsables de l'infrastructure de calcul haute performance dans leurs divers établissements de recherche, enseignement supérieur aux technologies, la HPC les plus avancées. Tous les administrateurs système au Nigeria et en Afrique subsaharienne doivent postuler et doivent remplir le formulaire de demande via la liaison à l'écran et aussi envoyer un courriel à as.covenantuniversity.edu.ng ou encore visiter le www.as.covenantuniversity.edu.ng .covenantuniversity.edu.ng bar workshop pour plus d'informations. Thank you for being with us. Events update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAUTV official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org. I am Isabella Tisaninapa. Je suis Imelda Amoudi. People who take part in the activities are sensitive to do so because they believe in the will of aiding their country to develop. With the highest volunteerism in the country, there is no connection, there is no correlation, there is no relationship between volunteerism and development. You presented your position, in other words, your thesis statement was very well couched and clearly presented. Welcome once again to Osakrum, the garden city and the capital of the Ashanti region. We are live in the Alote Auditorium of the College of Science in KNUST. We are still on the Yaz Intellectuals and today promises to be electrifying. We shall be seeing our uncompromising moderators come up with rapt attention as they take into account every word that slips out of a debater. The Royals of Jean Aka Nelson shall come up against the Vandals of Commonwealth Hall, both from the University of Ghana.
Once again, you warmly welcome. My name is Emmanuel Edujenfi, and of course, I'm here with Nanaba Amwa. And today, we have great teams that are taking part in this year's Intellectuals Bay show. Of course, we are in this beautiful garden city of Kumasi, and you're all warmly welcome. Okay, so we are coming live from KNUST yeah, in Osei Chrome, and we are going to have a very heated debate today. We'll go for a quick commercial break, and when we come back, the show continues. Twenty first century design made with durable materials, bristles crafted to reach in between your teeth, flexible, allows easy control. Introducing Yaz range of toothbrushes made for every pocket. For bulk purchases, call zero three zero two two three. 5294 Yaz toothbrushes clean teeth confident smile All right so thank you very much and welcome from the break First of all we have John Nelson from the University of Ghana Legon John Nelson as our name predicts we are the royal We have diversity when it comes to capacity that's why when it comes to education too, trust me, we are on top. If you come debate to just watch out for my guys, I can promise you this one is one of the finest of We have the men, we have the women, and we are the next batch of leaders in Ghana. We are not coming to joke at all! We're gonna blow your mind. Because Nelson, our standards are just up there. Other halls may be shouting, jumping, doing any wild thing you can think of. But Jen Nelson, we come cool and quiet. But we give you the best that will blow your mind. The intellectual debate! 2018. Watch out! You are coming with a bang! Royals! Royals. Nelson! Royals. Royals. Nelson! Ah! Royals. John Nelson is competing against Commonwealth Hall. Here is where everything starts from. Here is where everything ends. And I stood for the truth because when you are coming into the hall, you can see our stance, truth stance. We have excelled in every single position we found ourselves. We are taking over. Vandas have never lost. If you want to get it better, want to get it down, then involve the Vandas. You are spoken for the silent minority. We have been the voice when nobody was ready to speak. We come out home, as history holds it, have been able to produce a lot of big brains. The former president, Mahama, was a good communicator because he was in our debate team. So when you are talking about debate, where else do you look at? It's just common water. So wherever you are, whoever you may find yourself, get to know common water is in the race. We don't only talk, but we prove it with actions. They can shout, they can make the noise. But wait, let's get to the battlefield. The intellectuals debate. We are ready as vandals and we make sure truth stands. We win, we win, we win. And that is what we know. We made. forget that this show is proudly sponsored by Yaz and supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. It's going to be quite an interesting one. We've already had very, very, very heated debate right here. And I'm sure uh, we have supporters of John Nelson right here with us. And of course, Commonwealth Hall, popularly known as Vandal. So we're going to get very much started with this particular program. Okay, Kwabna. So um, the debate topic for today is volunteerism is an interest that is lost in the Ghanaian. This is a contributing factor in lack of developmental growth in the country. Before we move on to the debate, Pabna kindly introduce our moderators. All right, so for our moderators, we have Dr. Oseni Adam. Shall we uh, welcome him with a round of applause? And we also have with us here Professor Goski Alabi. A round of applause for We also have Professor Martin Ousu with us. So they are going to make sure we have a very wonderful time right here. Jean Aka Nelson Hall of University of Ghana is speaking for the motion. And Commonwealth Hall is speaking against the motion. John Nelson will start it off for us. 
the honorable chairperson, the judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, I am Kumasa Molara and I speak for the motion. According to the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, volunteerism is a feature of all cultures and societies. It is a fundamental source of community strength, resilience, solidarity and social cohesion. It can help effect positive change by fostering inclusive societies that respect diversity, equality and the participation of all. Such contributions are vital to promoting peace and security, advancing development and protecting human rights and dignity. Now, to establish the context of this debate, we argue that volunteerism for the purpose of this debate would denote activities undertaken by a person or group of individuals by free will for the general public good without expectation of remuneration for whatever services are rendered. Emphasis will be placed on volunteerism by nationals directed at meeting the country's needs and the general promotion of the welfare of citizens. However, we will not overlook voluntary activities that are undertaken by nationals for the benefit of an international region of which Ghana is a part and is also applicable in this debate. Now finally, we we'll seek to reveal the absence of volunteering, of volunteering spirit in the Ghanaian and how this contributes to the country's state of underdevelopment. Now we start. Ghana is a developing country and we all agree. And this characterization is almost inextricably linked with, un with high unemployment, inadequacy of relevant infrastructure, inefficient public structures, low literacy and poor access to vital health services for the majority of the nationals. While measures are being put in place by the government to address these problems through education and improve production, there still exists a large percentage of individuals experiencing no immediate alleviation from these urgent challenges. Since the improvement of the standards of living of these people is extremely important for the general national development, an efficient measure that is sensitive to the limitations of the system is required to address these needs. And this measure we pose to you is volunteerism. Now, for the proof of our premise, we, we are going to present you two case scenarios which buttress our point that indeed volunteerism should, is, a, is necessary and is a contributory factor to the development of a country. According to the annual report of the Ghana Health Service, a lament on inadequate volunteers and low commitment of volunteers in rural districts leading to poor health status of those indigents. The failure of the village volunteer system, which was introduced by the Ghanaian government in the 1970s due to apathy of trained volunteers and misappropriation of resources, brings us to this present situation. That is why we are having this debate. Now, these cases occurred in the presence of a sizable number of capable youth with access to training and flexibility of service. The absence of volunteerism is unjustified because aside the poor, unemployed and incapable, there exists a large number of nationals with free time and resources to volunteer their skills to aid the less fortunate in areas including but not limited to health, education, agriculture and social activism. Now, to the thematic cases and evidence that we provide you, we start with volunteerism says serves as a means for basic equity. Although there exist state machinery and systems run by governments to enhance living standards or grant access to basic necessities, the nature of Ghana as a developing country within, within an equally developing sub-region demands a plethora of wants to be met with limited state funds. As such, the government on its own is under intense pressure to deliver these goals to the benefit of the society. It then behooves on individuals or groups of individuals who are in a capacity and are themselves beneficiaries of the state investment to share some of their good via voluntary social aid like outreaches, programs, and, um, and any other activity that will help reach the set of people who remain destitute or underdeveloped and in disadvantage in the society. Secondly, we present to you that volunteerism acts as an instrument of change in a developing state. The manner, now let, let me set this right for the understanding of all of us, the manner in which a theory can be assessed with regards to its relevance in a state is by identifying the actual areas where this can be utilized and showing how this is relevant to required groups. Within Ghana, there are loads of pressures on our government and in fact we all do in every single way place pressure on our government to provide equitable access to social services to all the peoples, but then we tell you that this is a limitation because it does not reach to, the, to serve the immediate needs of the victimized sex. Let's consider the scenarios of accidents, of floods, and where we have the national 
disaster management organization being contacted to help salvage their situations. Now, when we observe that, when we look on as citizens and we tend to refer our duties to the government and say that, oh yes, whatever this problem is, it's up to the government to solve it. For example, flat, we leave it to the government to come and solve it for us. That is where we tell you that we need to develop the volunteering spirit in each of us as individuals and as patriotic citizens of this country. But let's reconsider these scenarios realistically. Before the government can contribute to, before the government can serve its purposes, before we get up to hell insults at the authorities, we should first recall that we are immediate patriotic citizens and we do have a quota to play to the development of the country. We should not overlook that part. Thus, the differences in social equality that inevitably plague human, humanity better place us all to aid one another at points in which a point in time when our abilities come in handy, which brings the theory of volunteerism. We move on, volunteerism as a factor for enhanced leadership. The motive of volunteerism is fueled by free, by free spirited will for service, which places the interest of those being served at the fore of the activity. Unlike monetarily incentivized activity, which has remuneration fueling the service being rendered, voluntary service subtly inculcates the spirit of service in individuals and causes them to be sensitive to the needs of the people first and further aids them to realize the greater good of service. Noting that leaders emerge from the population itself, we must realize the caliber of leaders we would have if volunteerism was at its peak in the country. Leaders whose sole motive is to address the demands of the people with issues like money and benefits being subservient to this cause, thus directly tackling the root of corruption which emerges from self-prioritization. Now, we we'll also present to you international cases which buttress our point. In Ireland, volunteer organizations such as Poor Poverty Initiative perform free services and donate goods to poor and impoverished communities, which improves the quality of life for the less fortunate in society. For the benefits of the disabled minority, which is often left out of the major government policies, the MenCap Live Net Volunteer Group offers and organizes teaching and training sessions complementing the existing measures to create more equality in the society. Let's take South Africa. The Child Welfare South Africa Initiative is responsible for, creating, for catering for the immediate health, safety and educational needs of the underprivileged children in rural South Africa. This has boosted youth literacy and welfare in the country with positive effects on the country's development. Finally, in conclusion, volunteerism is not the only determinant of national development. Many others exist. However, in a country like Ghana, where other... Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Can we have the principal speaker speaking against the motion? Distinguished panel of judges, Never have we been so proud to oppose a motion like this one because we think that in order to truly liberate Ghana from the shackles of underdevelopment, the right factors that inhibit our underdevelopment should be identified and mechanisms should be put in place to address those factors. In this debate, we are not the side that says volunteerism has no benefits. So all his analysis about volunteerism has some benefits here and there actually falls flat. That is not what this debate is about. This debate is about accessing the impacts of volunteerism and accessing the benefits of volunteerism and analyzing whether those are significant enough to prevent Ghana from developing. That is what this debate is about. Not necessarily you telling us that volunteerism is down uh, because uh, volunteerism has benefits. We have two basic stance in today's debate. First, we are going to establish to you that volunteerism as an interest is something that is not lost in Ghana. And we'll show you why that is particularly important in today's debate. Secondly, we are going to analyze you that even if we were to assume that volunteerism is lost in Ghana, why its impact is insignificant for us to consider it as a contributory factor to our underdevelopment. A couple of clarifications in today's debate. Yes, we say that this motion is in two parts. There is a first part that says volunteerism is an interest that is lost in Ghana. 
and this is a contributory factor. So there exists a premise and there exists a conclusion. The premise part is that volunteerism is an interest that is lost in Ghana. So their burden is to establish to us that volunteerism is actually something that is lost in Ghana. And because volunteerism is lost in Ghana, that is why we are not having development. If we can prove to you in today's debate that in Ghana volunteerism is not an interest that is lost, they lose this debate. This is basic logic 101. This is critical thinking ABC. First. So let me give you an example. Let me give you an example to clarify. If I tell you that the reason why I failed mathematics was because, one of the reasons why I failed mathematics was because I had no calculator. And you are able to actually prove to me that I actually had a calculator, then that means you deny me my ability to use my lack of calculator as one of the reasons for which I failed math. So we also deny them their ability to use the fact that Ghanaians don't have volunteerism and actually show that the conclusion that they drive from it is actually flawed and doesn't stand in today's debate. So what proposition side in today's debate wants you to believe is that Millions of Guyanians are not having health care because Guyanians are not helping each other. They want you to believe that the reason why we have a vibrant unemployment graduates association is because Guyanians are not helping each other. We think that these are very, very ridiculous. First thing is why volunteerism is not lost. First argumentation is on the level of the existence of empirical evidence. We think that the very existence of this uh, competition in and of itself is somehow indicative of the fact that Guyanians are always willing to volunteer. We don't think YAS organize this thing solely because they want to make profit. They recognize that they need to groom the next generation of debaters. They recognize that they need to volunteer for their nation in this particular way. So if you have the existence of these things, if you have the existence of companies, of groups, for example, on com campus here, there are so many volunteer groups that are there. We think that all these are indicative of the fact that people are increasingly engaging in volunteerism. Why? For two reasons. Because a Ghanaian value system recognizes that volunteerism is something that is important. We recognize that we should help each other. Volunteerism is basically about help, and they are accepted to this definition. So if Ghanaians we help each other, and it is preached in Ghanaian value system as an acceptable thing, that pushes people to set up volunteering companies in Ghana, and we have a plethora of them in Ghana. He will give you examples. A second thing is because we get a sense of personal accomplishment when we volunteer, and this is why people continuously engage in volunteerism. On another level, we have people People doing personal volunteerism. When we were coming here, we got lost on the way. Someone volunteered and brought us here. All these are indicative of volunteerism being in existence in Ghana. The third argument is the third argument on this particular point is the existence of things that motivate us to want to volunteer. We tell you that religious organizations, for example, increasingly tell their members why they need to be good to their neighbors, why they need to help others, why they need to help the less privileged. We tell you that these things drive people to want to volunteer. A second thing is because because of the visual feelings the media creates in us. Uh, as the pictures of images, uh, schools and the trees, we want to volunteer all, all of these things. So, their premise that volunteerism is lost in Ghana, who led them to the conclusion that this is a contributing factor to our development, actually falls and they fall flat in today's debate. The second argumentation that we bring into today's debate is talking about the fact that even if we were to assume that volunteerism is lost in Ghana, which is not true, I've proved to you why, let us tell you why volunteerism is not a contributing factor to Ghana not having proper mechanisms and Ghana being underdeveloped. Two argumentations in today's debate. First, it's an examination of the global trajectory for development. We tell you that nations like United States didn't develop at a particular point in time whereby they were blaming things like volunteerism and saying we are not developing because volunteerism is there. The global trajectory shows that nations develop at a point whereby they provided platforms for the thriving of capitalistic ideas. One, a two, when states actively supported science and technology, when states invested actively into the economy. Nations like United States and the global hegemonic forces that we are now seeing today didn't get to their extent case because they were blaming volunteerism. We don't think that volunteerism plays anyway. If volunteerism was a significant uh, determinant of development, then it should have been significant in the development of the United States. Uh, uh, Japan mentioned these companies. We think that the very fact that these were not critical in the formation of these nations, we think that we can't attribute, uh, we can't say that uh, this thing is actually a significant factor. But then the second reason is the argument, the argument that is based on the impact of volunteerism. Panel, we argue that for you to consider something as a contributing factor to development, when it is a high number, impact should be something that is so significant so that you can now make the argument that because it is not there and because you are denied of this impact that is why you are not developing we are going to in and take them at their best let us assume that every single person in ghana will
volunteering. We will tell you that the impact of this volunteerism is going to be very, very minimal, and we can't really consider volunteerism as something that contributes to our underdevelopment. Here's why. Because if people want to volunteer in Ghana, because they lack access to capital because we are poor, you don't expect an unemployed uh, graduate to go and volunteer and get anything meaningful from it. So the impact of his volunteerism is going to be basically minimal. Secondly, you don't have the structures that will support his volunteerism. So even if I want to go to Ponta Mele and teach, because I don't have proper roads to get to Ponta Mele, I won't get there. So my volunteerism is very, very minimal. So the fact that we are not getting volunteer, uh, so much impact from an increased interest in volunteerism, that automatically shows that we are not being denied of anything special if we are going to assume that volunteerism is, uh, if we are going to assume that volunteerism is as high as that is, assuming that every single person is uh, volunteering in Ghana. But then let us do some um, engagement to these people. They say that the Ghana Health Service says uh, that people are falling sick because people are not volunteering. First level of argumentation is it is never the job of volunteers to provide health care for people. It is the job of governments to do it. So if they are basically saying that the Ghana Health Service has done that, that was never the job of uh, volunteers to begin with. Governments need to invest capital and government needs to do this. We think that there are more fundamental things. And when we are talking about volunteer uh, development, let us not kid ourselves and let us not focus on things that are very, very periphery and things that are not fundamental in the determination of our development. We should focus on more things. The global forces do not get there because of development. Secondly, we've taken, out, we've taken away the, their premise to make that uh, conclusion that we are not developing because of volunteerism, because volunteerism is actually there. This competition is very, very much indicative of that, and several other examples that we gave you. And the third analysis that we gave you in today's debate is the fact that the impact of volunteerism is not so nice. If you are going to have a high interest in volunteerism, and panel notes, interest, a high interest in volunteerism, that interest will not automatically translate to a very beneficial thing because of the two factors that I analyzed to you. So interest in volunteerism, which is what this debate is about, doesn't do anything because people are constrained by these two forces. We are incredibly proud to oppose. Thank you very much. I'm sure we appreciate the fact that we have critical thinkers and great speakers right here with us on the YAS Intellectuals Debate Show. And of course, let me quickly say that this program is sponsored by YAS. And I've told you about a toothpaste which kills or very harsh on germs and very mild on the gum. So make sure you get a toothpaste. And YAS has already promised us that they are going to give each and one of us here something to take home. And so we should be very expectant of that. And so that's the situation. And again, we are also supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. Wide wings and leak guards. Yes, solitary pads give you maximum comfort, hygiene, and protection in a resealable pack. We've got Yas protection. Yes, solitary pads. Maximum protection, maximum confidence. No worry, we've got Yas protection. Thank you very much and welcome from the break. On this note, let me call on the first supporting speaker for the motion. The Honorable Chairperson, Panel of Judges, Accurate Timekeeper, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what opposition fails to realize in this debate is that this debate doesn't seek government to prove that volunteerism is the savior of the Ghanaian, of the Ghanaian economy, or that volunteerism is the thing that will save us from the shackles of underdevelopment or whatever. What it asks us to do is prove that one, volunteerism is indeed lost in the Ghanaian culture, which I'll prove to you as he fails to see, and two, show you how that in itself is going to be requisite to help salvage development and aid in little ways that in themselves are requisite to push a developing nation like Ghana to where we seek to be. Start off with some rebuttals. One, Ziad claims that volunteerism doesn't, is, um, is not lost in Ghana and we have people who donate to where they cost in their life. We agree, but these are singular cases that show like volunteerism going on in the system. But let me prove to you on a large scale, how is non volunteerism going on in the country? Now, take a classic example of the National Service Scheme, where students are posted after their teacher education to go out there to work. You have majority of students who come out trying to find areas where they can go in there to loot money to, to aid themselves, showing a spirit of not willingness to work volunteerism, but rather a monetary incentive being what's at the fall of what they want, as opposed to like, the, the main aim of volunteerism being them going out to work 
to aid the populace. Now, this last section of students who come out of the population are, 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 are evidence of how the populace is not geared towards volunteerism of late, and how the majority of us, even though we still have single instances of volunteerism, are not willing to aid in the study school to aid volunteerism and showing how we need sensei students to do so. Also, on how volunteerism is relevant to liberating the Ghanaian economy. Now, as I said early on, it's not up to us to prove how volunteerism is going to be the sole savior of saving the Ghanaian economy. And evidently, we think it's touristic that there is no way volunteerism will be a singular way or means of aiding the economy to reach them, uh, to reach whatever goals they want to reach. But however, what we have to prove to you is how volunteerism itself is going to be a requisite tool to aid development. Now, why do I say this? On two levels. One, we tell you development begins with a sensitized, a sensitized populace. Now, we tell you that with volunteerism, Voluntarity possesses a spirit where people who take part in the activities are sensitized to do so because they believe in the will of aiding their country to develop. That itself is the fulcrum of any country's development since them being sensitized to like, aid their countries is the very start of genesis of any country developing. So without the spirit in there, you have no, you have no country going on since the people themselves aren't willing to be sensitized to go on. Which is very thing is, which is found in voluntarism and we push for and believe will aid the country to reach where we want to reach over our goals. Secondly, on the nature of developing countries and governments and how volunteerism will aid to push us wherever we want to reach. Now we tell you that within every developing country, governments are hard pressed since all around, all people are asking them to aid them in various ways, building roads, schools, hospitals. Now we tell you that since these governments are hard pressed, they can meet the teeming demands of each and every single one of the populace at a point in time where they would well need to do so due to the majority of people who need help and the government being hard pressed with funds and time to do so and reach out to everyone simultaneously. And note, it's a hard pressed teaming demands like flood victims, like monetary issues and the like. So what then do we do as citizens who can aid? Within communities, you have people who are wealthy and the rich who can aid like, who can aid these causes by giving out to the poor and the, and the vulnerable and helping them to save their immediate situations as opposed to waiting for the government to in the, in the latter times. Bringing it to my third rebuttal on unav unavailable structures. Now we do believe that indeed there could, there could be unavailable structures in developing countries which could even impede volunteerism. Now, but why do we still think that volunteerism can still work in these countries? Well, again, on two levels. One, we think that within developing nations, the nature of the economy allows a wealthy class to still have enough resources and money circulates in that state. And so the, the wealthy class in societies can be able and competent able to aid development via volunteerism by donating to courses and helping them to, um, to do what they want to do, via courses like donating for said, like wealth in terms of like, insurgents. Limited to just say monetary given, but the volunteerism goes beyond those frontiers and goes to communal, communal and other stuff which just require normal energy and normal uh, time and resources that people have um, have for them. And so we believe that even within the poorest in the in the district area, they don't need money per se to be able to volunteer to aid courses, but simply giving time, money, energy, and the like for issues like communal labor and the like are all forms of volunteerism which you think will go on to help the country, considering our poor sanitary conditions within the, within um, our country. No matter. I'll add more flesh to what the Prime Minister said with regard to volunteerism. One, on volunteerism being an instrument of change in developing countries, we tell you developing countries need a dire sense of urgency with regard to solving their problems. And the governments are hard pressed and cannot reach out to all these at, at simultaneously. As such, what do the wealthy do to aid these situations? Do they all sit back and wait for a government to reach out to everyone? What would be impossible due to the logical nature of this? And, or, secondly, do they aid by coming out voluntarily to aid courses via donations, by outreach and like, which people do, like for example, doctors, um, Ghanaian doctors, you know, doctors to go out to the north to reach out to um, the sick out there to help them in the north, as opposed to with the doctors to reach them and um, to put it to the, the northern areas to aid them. Thank you very much. All right, can we have the first supporting speaker against the motion? Chairperson, panel of judges, accurate timekeepers. My name is Safu Kwame Oheneba. Greetings from the Vandal City. The chair of the house, government loses this debate when they characterize us as the side who is saying we shouldn't volunteer. We are for volunteerism. What we are saying is that if you are to blame our lack of development in Ghana, you can't say volunteerism is that cause or a contributory factor to that lack of development. That is something they miss in this debate. It is very ironic for us to stand on a stage where we argue, yes, uh, sponsors a program about promoting great leaders in the future, something which is voluntary. They are not going to get any monetary gain or anything from it. They sponsor people to come here and sit down. And at the end of the day, you tell me volunteerism is an interest which is lost in Ghana. We feel this is a disregard to voluntary groups like Destiny Child Foundation, which is made up of the social works of 
Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, which comes together to make sure that they go for charity and make sure they alleviate poverty in our society. We believe that you disregard this when you tell me that volunteerism is an interest that is lost. We believe that is false. Volunteerism is not lost and it's in the status quo. Now, engaging Solomon. Solomon, to use a point to win, talks about national service scheme and the way people use national service scheme. We believe national service scheme is not something which is voluntary because if you don't do your national service, you can't become an MP. They check all these things. These things are prerequisite to become big people in the future. So it's not something which is uh, vol voluntary has to be free will. It is not something which is free will. You are obligated to do it. So don't come and talk about national service here. He comes here and he also talks about the agency and the need to sensitize people. People in the status quo are already sensitized. That is why people who can't contribute in their any way goes on, uh, goes on radio and bring out their frustration and how they feel that the country should develop. These are always people are volunteering. So I'll come to my point where I show you that volunteerism as an interest is not lost, but it's because of something constraint like monetary factors and lack of resources. That's why we can't see it. Now they characterize volunteerism again as something which is supposed to be grand, like building. Dia tells you, even in helping us get here, the person indirectly has volunteered. We give you an example of even Kwame Despite when he built a, a child maternity ward for the 37 military hospital. All these are volunteerism acts and they should close but they should pay close attention to it now let's take them please who has heard of Turkmenistan in this book no one has heard of Turkmenistan Turkmenistan is the first country which has the highest voluntary rate Turkmenistan rates ahead of US they rate ahead of the UK they have the highest voluntary rate yet still Turkmenistan is so impoverished and it's underdeveloped Turkmenistan has gas natural resources but cannot make good use of that natural resources then what is the need of this volunteerism volunteerism is high they surpass America they surpass UK and yet still they are impoverished we tell you that volunteerism there is no nexus between volunteerism and development I give you the second most contributing country to volunteerism is Myanmar and we all know what's going on in Myanmar with the Rohingya Muslim and a lot of ethnic cleansing. It's a place which is a living hell to live in. And yet, though, they are the people with the highest volunteerism in the country. There is no connection. There is no correlation. There is no relationship between volunteerism and development. Now, on the impact, we tell you that even if volunteerism, every single person in this building volunteers, we are still not going to feel the maximum impact on our development. Because you may have the interest to volunteer, but because of constraints like, let's say you are going to build a school, you might have the capital sometimes, all right. But that money to maintain that school you have built, you end up having schools which uses stones as mounds and stuff like that. We believe that this capital, this constraint, people have the interest, but they lack that constraint. And if you say we have gained something, that if we have lost volunteerism, you have to pair logic. That means we had volunteerism in the past and now we have lost it. But we tell you that when we had voluntarism in the past, if that's what they claim, then Ghana should have been very developed because we had voluntarism. But research shows that our ADI level and our GDP level has risen even in a year which you are saying voluntarism is lost. So comparatively, 1990s or in the past when you said we gained voluntarism, per this status quo which you claim we don't have voluntarism, our development level is even higher than the times where you said we lack voluntarism. The chair of the house, we need to make something very clear in this debate. We tell you that for something to become a contributory factor, that means it has to be very significant. We believe that the contribution of voluntarism is insignificant or not that much to be classified as a voluntary factor. An example is if I go to the Google Blue Market and Parliament wants to solve something like air pollution, uh, excuse my language, but let's say Ziad fat at Abu Bulochi market. But Ziad fatting at Abu Bulochi market is not going to be something Parliament has to stand on to say we are going to ban air pollution. The things they will look at are the drain gutters and stuff like that. We have pressing needs like corruption and all other stuff. Thank and you. Terrorism is not the cause of our lack of development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shall we have the second supporting speaker for the motion? Panel, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, before I focus on the contribution of opposition to this debate, we would handle some rebuttals of the cases of opposition. Now, first, on their argument on how voluntarism is not a contributing factor, giving examples of Turkmenistan and Myanmar, we tell you exclusively from proposition that states truly improve mainly by capitalism and all that they say. Now, Ghana is doing all of this. Trying to and I is trying to improve by putting in all 
this is to ensure that we are industrialized and we capitalize and we need to develop. Yet, the progress is extremely slow and we are facing very urgent problems in Ghana. So, in the absence of governments with certain regions, what do we do in the meantime to save thousands of lives who are suffering? You volunteer by offering free labor to help these people to alleviate their problems so they can also contribute to national development. Secondly, they tell you that this debate is about volunteerism and as, a, as a significant contributing factor. Now, we tell you that Ghana is a developing country. That means that our needs are very, very urgent. People are dying from malaria and some from urgent problems. Now, let's take them at their best. Even if volunteerism would help only 1% of citizens, that is hundreds of thousands of individuals who will now be capable of contributing to the national development of the country. So their arguments on that basis is very ludicrous. Thirdly, we tell you that volunteerism is lost in Ghana for the following reasons. Now we tell you that proportional to the wealth in Ghana, proportional to the youth size of Ghana, statistics which we show you from proposition, they just tell you about an individual escorting them to this place. We give you statistics from GHS, we give statistics from the four, from the four poverty initiative, etc., to show you why statisticians have brought our reports to prove that volunteerism is on the low. They give you only assertions, and hence we can't take them at their best in this debate. Now, on our fourth point, we show you how production and productivity as the way forward even better helps our part. Now, production of goods and services is a capitalist world that they cherish on their side. Now, by providing free labor from volunteerism and reducing the amount of capital spent on paying individuals, you have even more money to capitalize and industrialize because then you have more money left over to build more factories, to industrialize and capitalize as they see on their side. Now, on their fifth argument that government should take more responsibility, we tell you that government is faced with so many limitations and plagued with the evils of politics. Now, citizens should not be spectators, should not be spectators as given by our own president. So we as citizens should be the change that we want to see in the country by volunteering. Now, they also tell you that people cannot volunteer because they, can, they don't have the money, they don't have the ability, they don't have the etc. So people live in plush hostels. Students own Range Rovers. Politicians and businessmen own a lot of wealth. If the poor cannot do it, these select people have the ability and the placement to volunteer to help a community. We are proud to propose. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, second supporting speaker, for the motion. We still like to acknowledge our sponsors, and the show is proudly brought to you by Yaz, range of products, Yaz, pads, sanitary towels, grades for the month. Every lady should be able to get their Yaz sanitary towel for very comfortable feeling during the month. All right, we'll take on our second supporting speaker against the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ankoma Kelvin from Commonwealth Hall. The first question in this debate, we talk to you about volunteerism not being lost. As against they telling you that volunteerism is being lost in the status quo. We gave you instances about like the narrative being preached in a society. We needing to prove and like educate people. Already in the status quo, we see people are volunteering because that's the stance, right? They paint a picture that volunteerism is only about giving grant and giving money, right? But students, even in the tertiary institutions, as Safo told you, creating NGOs, trying to do a little step to help. It's all about volunteerism because they're not doing it for any monetary reward. They're doing it to help society. As against them telling you that the Ghana Health Service, right? They give you a, a, something about Ghana Health Service and saying that because people are not healthy in the health sector. That's case, like. It's a burden on governments as they had proved to you in this debate, right? We are talking about little things that individual citizens do that contribute to development in the country. So on that clash, most importantly, we show you and taking them at their best and saying that even though volunteerism is lost, it's not a major contributory factor. We tell you that for something to be discussed as a contributory factor in the country's development means that when the thing is not there, right, like it should have a high impact, right? We gave you analysis of a country like Japan and China. They invested in science and technology and all these things, created the basis for their development, right? It was not issues about volunteerism or whether volunteerism is lost or not. We think that it's very problematic. So we tell you that volunteerism, even though in the status quo, let's say that even if it's lost, we say, 
day. It's not a contributory factor we should concentrate all our efforts on to solve, right? Then we tell you, giving you the like the parallel relationship between volunteerism and development. We tell you that looking at countries such as Myanmar and uh, Turkmenistan, as we give you, right? There's volunteerism upright. There's volunteerism going on in the status quo. But what correlation has it got with development? We say that concentrate on the key factors that lead to the development of a country, other than these things, right? Then we tell you on a realistic case, like most importantly, let's say um, the impact of volunteerism. So let's say even if volunteerism is on the high, but now we see that there are structures that inhibit people. So let's say we all here have the moral obligation, we are all intrinsically motivated to volunteer. But we talk about there's no development because the people don't have the capital to actually make the move as these people say. Secondly, we tell you that the structures are inhibiting in themselves. So we say personal like self-preservation is very important. If I want to go and teach people in some village in Ayawa, so and like uh, there are bad roads there, I think of myself first, right? These things are inhibiting factors and these things like inhibit the impact of volunteerism. So we consider the fact that yes indeed if every single individual in the country wants to volunteer and hence there are structures such as capital and structures inhibiting these people to volunteer we find that very problematic in the start school doesn't mean like volunteerism falls flat in this bit but lastly we we'll talk to you about like thank you round of applause for all of them they've done a wonderful job they've done a great job right here and I'm sure we are all very much appreciative of what they've been able to do. Great minds at display. Very, very much intellectual. The Yaz Intellectuals. Grooming the next generation of great debaters. The Yaz Intellectuals. Grooming the next generation of great debaters. <laughs> all right. So we are proudly sponsored by Yaz. And they've told me they are going to give each and every one of us a present. So uh, don't go just yet. Uh, ju don't go just yet. And we are again supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. All right, so we'll go for a quick break. I love food frosted flakes because it's so crunchy and full of nutrients. All you need is milk. As usual, Mom. 99 minus 3, 2, 2. That's it? Yes? 90! Pustura Flakes has 9 essential nutrients with no artificial additives or colors. Yes? Food Frosted Flakes is rich in vitamin E, B12, iron, high in carbohydrate, fiber, protein, sodium, and it's very affordable. Care for him. Food Frosted Flakes! Food Frosted Flakes! All you need is milk! Each comes with three variants, Frosty Flakes, Choco Flakes, and Corn Flakes. Each bag has 10 mini packs of 50 grams, and each box you buy comes with a free exercise book. Hooch is available in all supermarkets and retail shops. Hooch Frosty Flakes. All you need is milk. Welcome back from that break. All right, so the Yaz Intellectual is fostering national cohesion through dialogue exactly so. and we can see that exactly being displayed here on the stage okay our moderators are ready with their data and then we'll find out which team did justice to their topic the judges scored independently we put our totals together and here are the composite overall totals. One side scored 54.5. Another side scored 71.8. The one side has scored the winning number of 71.8 is those against the motion that is commonwealth and g nelson is called 54 5. it is the opinion of the judges that these two sides have presented excellent excellent debating skills Let's give them all a round of applause. 
Once again, congratulations to all the competing teams, to Jen Nelson and also to the winning side, that is the Commonwealth Hall. We would like to say again that in this competition, there are no losers, there are only contributors. So you have all contributed well to the motion. We made a few observations and would like to touch on those observations. We believe that this team has presented one of the most exciting and very academically sound, intellectual, and critically well-taught competition or presentation. And we say congratulations to that. The Jen Nelson side was very poised and very calm in their presentations. They actually sought to establish a construct of volunteerism. They constructed volunteerism from their point of view as it relates to what they were about to present. And that, we thought, was a very good thing they did. We didn't have that from the opposing side. They also came up with some case scenarios which they wanted to use to establish their point. We, however, found that most of the time, the presenters were reading rather than presenting. So it's something that we hope you would improve upon the next time. We also noted that few instances, one of the presenters was pocketing, was putting the, the, the hands or the palms in the pocket. And sometimes we do recognize that is a way of gaining one's composure to be able to flow on the whole. We believe that you did a great job, and the points you made attest to that fact. On the side of the um, winning team, that is Commonwealth Hall, it was very intellectual. In fact, the most intellectual that I have observed so far in this competition. This is because you first established the premise and assumptions of the debate or the topic itself. You presented your position. In other words, your thesis statement was very well couched and clearly presented. You raised arguments for and against, and your work was very well researched with good supporting evidence to every point that you sought to advance. The first presenter did a really great job for the team, and we say congratulations. The second presenter did very well, but occasionally was a little bit quite emotional. Excellent exposition. Thank you very much. Okay, this show was proudly brought to you by Yaz Range of Products supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. We'll see you once again. Bye-bye from us.
Hey, so this is Dishan from Unica University Common Application. I recommend you to watch AAU Television. AAU TV is the place to be for every person in higher education in Africa. Better be there or be nowhere. Continue to watch la, la télé and surtout sur le AAU. Keep watching it and it will change the way you interact with higher education on the continent. AAU, great job. I want to tell you that AAU Television is fantastic. It's educative, it's informative, and it is a must for anybody who is interested in higher education in Africa. When I was in Accra last year, I did an interview on this TV. It's a very important mouthpiece. It's a data, it's, it's a bank of all we need for the development of higher education in Africa. People should make an effort to view it because it discusses very current issues of development across the continent. I believe that the station will continue to promote the overall development of Africa, particularly in the tertiary education sector. AAU TV provides a platform and shares a lot of information to a broader audience. So we wish you all the best and please continue serving. AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. COVID-19 pandemic has necessitated the need for higher education institutions to establish their impact through applied research. It is in this regard that the Africa Centers of Excellence for Impact Project, a higher education project supporting universities in West Africa, has engaged in groundbreaking researches in managing the virus within the sub-region. The 53 centers across the continent are putting in place measures to manage the pandemic in their respective countries. In Nigeria, the Africa Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases, ASGID, at Redeemers University, in coordination with the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, was the first institution in Africa to successfully sequence genomes of SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19 virus. This will strengthen surveillance for tracking mutations of the virus. The center has also developed a COVID-19 screening tool to measure individual risk level. Also, AgeJid seeks to use advanced genomics science to accelerate the production of a homemade vaccine against the virus. The West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, WACBIP, a cell biology research center dedicated to the diagnostics of tropical diseases in sub-Saharan Africa at the University of Ghana has also successfully sequenced genomes of SARS-CoV-2. This is a milestone in Ghana's response to the pandemic, as it well aid in the tracing of the sources of community infections in people with no known contact with confirmed cases. Other centers of excellence are contributing to knowledge on management of the virus through innovative research. Centers such as the Regional Transport Research and Education, TREK, hosted by the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST, examined how the COVID-19 is spreading in time and into new areas, its impact on urban mobility and the environmental effect of the lockdown. To support continuous teaching and learning in their respective institutions, the Africa Centers of Excellence are adopting innovative measures by moving classes online. Learning management systems such as Modo, Sakai, Google Classroom, among others, are being used. The Africa Center of Excellence project is a flagship program where the World Bank in partnership with the French Development Agency, AFD, and regional partners such as the Association of African Universities and ECOWAS are supporting African governments to invest in quality postgraduate education and applied research.
understanding causality. In this session, I'll just maybe give us a summary of what we are uh, expecting to do, to learn at the end of this session, and from there we can take it up. So maybe three few uh, uh, outcomes we're expecting. One is to explain the different notions of causal relationships. We are going to do that. We're also going to uh, learn how to apply causality in our research. And uh, we'll also be able to appraise a given causal research so that we'll be able to interrogate a, a research and see if it is causal, if it is something else. We're going to describe some other things beyond causal research. So, but before I do that, I think we can start from maybe exposing ourselves to what we know and what we do not know. What type of research do we do? Are there really, when we use the word causal research, do you appreciate what I, I want to say? What do you mean by causal research? Causal research. Do anybody have any idea? Yes, Emmanuel. Yeah, higher? Uh, Dad. Dad. Mm. Okay. A research involving connections of variables. Good. A research involving connection of variables. Yes. Okay. I think it's a starting point. Any other suggestion? Yeah. Stephen? Something has to do with uh, empiricism. Empiricism. Empirical research. Empirical research. Relationship between two or more variables. Okay. Observing relationship between two or more variables. Yes, Norma. And I think in the relationship between the two variables, one is responsible for the other. A step further. It's just not beyond, it's beyond just looking at uh, variables, but one should be responsible for the other one. Yes, good. Yes. A research aim at, aim at finding out the effect of a particular problem and the causes of that problem. Okay. I think we are uh, we're all there. We are all there. B uh, back to our own experiences. Yes, Daniel, you wanted to say something? Uh, I was going to add that uh, both variables for causal uh, uh, research, they're trying to see if one variable, uh, if the outcome of something is or was as a result of a particular variable. Brilliant. We are looking at outcome. And they are looking back to be sure of what was responsible for that outcome. And they are looking at causal research. Yeah. Brilliant. Instance, uh, yes. Uh, example? Yeah, for instance, um, I looked at um, uh, British foreign policy in Sierra Leone and uh, why the change in government in 1997 saw a change in, in Britain taking a more proactive. Mm. So basically, what, what caused the Labour government to take a more proactive Actions. action in Sierra Leone than the previous government the government when the, the conflict started? Okay. So from my, uh, what I'm hearing here, I think I have no job this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely nothing to do. Because if you have been, you know it, and you have been doing it, then what it means that I have nothing to do this morning. But because... Pascal had asked me to be here to coordinate this morning's session. I have to stay here for the, ne for the next one hour or two. Maybe in the process of doing that, may also see more other things and see the... Maybe others who have really done this will share their experiences. And some of us who are not so comfortable with it may begin to think about doing something that they are doing. Or maybe if there's a, a better way of doing it, we can also learn. I think that's the main reason why I should continue to stay. If not, I would say to have a beautiful day. Okay, that's good. We're, we're going to learn. Yes. Okay, so let's discuss together, uh, sharing our experiences on causality. So, we are going to look at this from maybe a broader perspective, looking at descriptive studies and looking at causal studies. And maybe from there we can begin to see uh, the possibilities and what we are doing maybe before now and what we needed to do from now. Surely, Different type of analysis, will de what will determine the type of analysis you do will be based on if you are focusing on a descriptive yeah. study or you are focusing on causal studies. Yes. But the challenge we have here as we're going to uh, maybe observe later from our own experiences is that sometimes we may be dealing with description and you assume that it's causal. And if you finish doing that, it may become very difficult 
for policy people to separate what we're doing from causal. And if it's not causal, it may become also difficult for policy interventions. And that's why we should be able, we should be very clear about description, separating it from causality. So that the, even the policy actors will appreciate the arena where you're operating from. And they'll be able to base their decision. If it's on description, they should know. Rather than maybe doing a descriptive study and claiming causality. And it may be a little bit problematic. I think I'm happy with where we are starting. At least most of us understand what we mean by causality and description. However, can I also go back a bit with us in terms of our experiences? What type of studies do we do? We have agreed that we will do causal. Some people have mentioned causal. But do you do descriptive studies at all? You know, can we share experience and tell us maybe the type of studies you did that to classify as descriptive? Can you get one input? Historical. Historical? Then when you say historical, what do you mean? Relating the story of okay. a community of a group. Okay. Yeah. You are describing. Uh, if I decide to tell my own the story of my own village or mm. my family mm. from the ancestral date, it's just describing what occurred. Okay. All it's right. Relating it with anything. Okay. Uh, process tracing. Let's be tracing a particular process. Uh, maybe another ground rule didn't include is that people should raise their voices. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, because if you are talking to yourself, you're also breaking the mutual respect, uh -huh. respect rules. Uh -huh. So please, when you are talking, please raise your voice a bit so that others will also appreciate what you are. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, uh, you, we could also refer to descriptive studies as uh, process tracing, for example, where you trace. Um, wherein you're simply des describing a particular process. Mm. So you, you want to basically just describe the policy process in Kenya or Nigeria. You're simply describing, you describe, simply describing without looking at some of, uh, sort of the critical elements, you know, and how connected those ones are. You know, you're just simply describing that this is the way policy is made in Nigeria from A to Z. Okay. So in addition, I would like also, brilliant. In doing that, maybe give you one example, if you can use your previous studies yeah. on what you did exactly, and so that I will appreciate it maybe more. Not theoretical this time, yeah. Yes. Uh, in my field, I mean, uh, we use a descriptive institutional approach where you describe the operation and the processes that are uh, former institution and informal institutional politics, mm. how they take place. For example, when I did my PhD, I used uh, this uh, approach to describe the roles and functions of uh, state legislatures. Mm. You know, what are the functions and uh, what ought to be, what ought to be their functions and, and I went to observe to see whether what we have in reality is, you know, what we, uh, we are thinking of. Okay. So that's what. Okay, that's brilliant. And I think it has its own merit. Because uh, what you feel may not be what is on ground. Mm -hmm. So you need that really to validate you know, some of it you are thinking. Yeah, Norma, you wanted to say something? Yes, I wanted to say that sometimes you can also do studies of prevalence of a particular issue. Yeah. For instance, I did the prevalence of selfie taking mm -hmm. among adolescents yeah. in Nigeria. And that's really a description, yes. You just want to know the prevalence and the, maybe the patterns, mm -hmm. who is doing it more. Mm -hmm. Is it among the young or the old, among men or women? And when you are dealing with that, we are doing, dealing with description. Am I right? Mm -hmm. It has its own merits too. Lynn, mm -hmm. have you done any study before? I haven't done any before, but maybe I can do some anthropological studies, like some of the work of Mark What yeah. people descriptive trying to find the culture of people in Samoa, that would be descriptive. Yeah. So yes, the descriptive in the sense that the questionnaire is used to collect data from the respondents and the analysis of the data is described as the descriptive statistics. I don't know what I'm calling it. Okay. I think we can come back to that. Because we are going to deal with, we have a method, more or less something of methods here. We are going to talk about mixed methods. Yeah. So we may be dealing with that more. Maybe you can use questionnaire to collect both qualitative, or you can do description with data you collected through questionnaire. Yeah. It can also be causal. It depends on the analysis, the level of analysis you are doing.
and uh, you focus on the study. But I agree with you, you can collect data through questionnaire and end up with description. It's possible. Mm -hmm. So that we're going to do that. Yes. Um, Evelyn? Yeah, thank you yes. so much. Uh, first of all, I'm, I should actually put a right there. I'm more from a business-oriented perspective. So it is actually my first time to interact with the, the more typical social research. But then, uh, going back to descriptive, normally it's more when you want to talk about or in, inter interrogate further a phenomenological issue. Just purely what pertains on that phenomenon. End of story. We are not looking in terms of how does it actually affect the society. I just want to know what is the character of evil. So what I deal with is how describe evil's character and all that stuff. Yeah. I don't go beyond asking how does evil's character actually influence lean or this. That is our understanding from my business perspective. I think the understanding from business perspective should be our understanding of what it is. <laughs> huh? I think all disciplines are the same. When they are dealing with description, it should be description, whether from business or from sociological, anthropological, whatever. I think it's the same thing. So now the question is, under what circumstances should we undertake either descriptive or causal studies? Although our focus this uh, morning is on causality. But we should also acknowledge that description is important in certain types of research. But we don't do description for description's sake. And we don't also engage in causal studies because we just want to establish causality. There must be something on ground before we do that. And what circumstances? I can open up discussion on that so that we don't need. There are two main conditions for thinking of either doing description or going causal. And from the business perspective. If you want to describe a phenomenon, you may be, uh, to understand how, what a phenomenon is, you may be dealing with description only. Mm. But if you want to make a step to see how this particular variable translates to changing the other variable, then you are already moving on the realm of, uh, 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 of causality. But these things are not just from nowhere. What should guide us should be the theory environment or the data environment. And when I talk about theory environment, I don't want us to go back to our basic thinking in our graduate school, theoretical framework, theories of this. I should just use the, hmm? I should just use the word, the basic explanations, explanations of a particular phenomenon. If it is well established in terms of theory, then you may begin to think of certain type of studies. Also, if that environment means what is known about empirical studies, evidence, that are there. If it's very rich that you have overwhelming empirical evidence, that's the type of, that, uh, type of study you should be targeting. So we can do maybe a typology of it and see the type of things we should be doing. When uh, Ev uh, Evelyn was talking about describing a phenomenon, when you are dealing, when you have very poor theory environment and the data environment is also very poor, what do you do? You may just be developing descriptions. Nothing is known about a phenomenon. What do you do? You have to first of all uh, tell us what it is. You cannot begin to say that this is related to this or this causes this if we do not even know anything about a particular phenomenon. So you may start off with description. And some of us in anthropological studies, that's what they usually do. A society is not, 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 not much is known about a society. An anthropologist will go in there there's no theory explaining any behavior. They don't even know what they're doing. In short, for, I can start from psychological perspective. Why I'm a psychologist by training. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a business psychologist anyway. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you want to look at maybe intelligence, and nobody has known anything about intelligence, you can't say that people who are intelli intelligent are going to be more productive workers because we don't even know what intelligence is. Am I right? So the first starting point is to describe intelligence. To understand what, are the intel what constitutes intelligence. When you say an intelligent person, what is it? Then you can begin to describe some dimensions, some components of intelligence. You can tease out certain things. And you can say because of this, if you are doing this, if you are doing this, if you have this, you are an intelligent person. Once you have known that, then other scientists can move on from there. To say, since this is intelligence, those who are intelligent, they cannot begin to make some proposals. And what do they do? 
Mm. They can begin to maybe test hypotheses. However, there's a, a, a situation where maybe the theory environment is rich a bit, but not much is known about, the, about that particular phenomenon in a particular setting. You can do description in another context. And uh, that's where I will be, be bring a lot of caution. And that's actually what we we'll do here in this part of the world. Most scholars here will tell you that because of nothing has been known about particular certain things that are doing a study of that in social environment. It's always difficult to explain that to scientists. Because that thing that is happening in that particular environment is not so peculiar yeah. to warrant scientific inquiry. I'll give you an example. I'm the current editor of our journal in Nigeria. And the first set of, uh, when I became the editor, the first set of manuscript that came was saying they were studying some maybe motivational issues among workers. And they said they are studying it in a Badon area. And the last studies were, studied, were in Lagos. They have been done in Lagos, they have been done in the Southeast, but no study has been done in Ibadaxis. <laughs> so for him, he can begin a description of a phenomenon in Ibadan. And I was wondering, what is so peculiar about Ibadan? In a, and they are talking about commercial banks. And maybe half of the people in Ibadan were posted from Lagos. <laughs> or they moved from the Southeast or from Abuja. And he's now trying to describe a phenomenon and tell us that it's so marvelous and the what scientific inquiries. What I just did was just to put a question mark, please start a new story. This story cannot fly. <laughs> and also, sometimes we may also feel that something was done in Europe, done in US, or uh, maybe done in maybe in, this, in South Africa and North Africa, East Africa, but it has not done in Western Africa. And you say we start a new study. For a typical, uh, uh, and you are going to send these papers for people, for editors, and unfortunately, about 99% of top line editors in the world are Euro-Americans. It's unfortunate. But that's also what is the reality on ground. 99% of top editors in the world are from this part of the world. And you are writing something and telling them you are dealing with South Africa, you are describing a phenomenon of Africa, but it has been described and well established in, in East Africa. And you assume that a white man will understand, they will not. For him or her, Every black man, irrespective of where you are coming from, are from one family and one, one, one country. You should they see Africa as a country. Are you aware of that? You should, once you move out of Africa and are discussing with a typical European, and he sees you a black man, he sees a, a, a Kenyan, he says, ah, he's from your place. He says, no, he's not from, he's from Kenya. Yes. Do you know him before now? For him, we will we'll eat from the same pot, we we'll really. But even we Africans, we can also be guilty of that. Of course. For instance, I could recall uh, we were going through uh, Kenya, Jomo Kaeta. Yeah. And then somebody just uh, blurted, Oh, West Africa, you West Africans, all here. Yeah. And I was saying, well, Is it a West Africa country? Yeah, you were. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, I'm sure that, that's yeah. a challenge. Yes. I think you can appreciate it. So you are telling a white man that you have done something in West Africa, and it has been done in East Africa and Southern Africa and wherever. And it's for him or her, we are the same. And our culture are the same. And that's what you are saying that is peculiar here is not peculiar for him. Whatever is happening in Nigeria should be the same thing happening in Kenya, should be the same thing for him, even in South Africa, even in North Africa, for goodness sake. For him, even in Egypt. Uh, Algeria, we are more or less related more to those in, within the, in the, the you know, Spain, wherever in Europe. They may have even more, their culture may be nearer than what you see from here. But for them, Africa is one country. So what it means, I'm saying, yes, you can describe something in another context, but you should do that with caution. You should do that with caution because you really need to prove that they are different and you should establish these differences. Some of us who also get rejection, uh, from who write because once you send papers, you must get rejection. The more you send, the more you get. <laughs> <laughs> my high, the highest level of uh, number of rejection I got was when I was in my uh, Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship between 2017 and, uh, uh, and 2018. It seems that every week I will get a rejection. Every week. 
uh, for obvious reasons, I was submitting more papers because I was doing nothing but writing. So, and most of the papers I had even before I went to Europe, I started writing them and cleaning them up. So, I was getting more rejections. And at that point, I was feeling that the, go the gods of my whatever, uh, the sins of my forefathers have followed me from Nigeria to Europe. <laughs> Uh, but what happened? Uh, within around 218 to 19, I published about 20 of them. So you knew what it is, and the best journals on it. So they started, we started cleaning them up, they, they come there. But the major criticism we usually have is that you want to say that something is happening even in Africa. Because theories are well established. And once I have a theory explaining something, human beings are the same. For you to say that this theory does not uh, apply to Africa is very difficult to prove, especially in business world. Why should a businessman who can motivate, there's well-developed theories of motivation, well-developed theories of support system in organization. Why do we feel that it works in US, it worked in Europe, it worked in Asia, why shouldn't it work here? Uh, do you understand? Okay, please, Michael. This is, this is actually a very important issue because mm. this was the subject of a panel that I participated in just, just recently in June in, in Montreal. Yeah. The International Public Policy Association Conference. For yeah. Uh, conference uh, and the issue was about the applicability of Western inspired theoretical traditions yeah. in public policy yeah. and the panel was to interrogate whether in fact those theories how applicable are those theories yeah. because there has been what I would refer to as some sort of subaltern reaction yeah. to this so-called Western conceived concepts yeah. that some theories some African scholars will find problematic yeah. when, take, when taken to Africa. So what I did was to look at a particular practice, which is evidence-based policy making, yeah. and to see which is, this one is actually based on last well stages approach to the policy process. Yeah. And the idea was, how applicable was this? And the panel was actually, we all were going to challenge. And so, yes, there are theories that you can say they're applicable, but you know, are they powerful enough to explain what's happening in the African context. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. So, so yes, um, you might say the stages approach. What I found in the case of Sierra Leone was that there's no way the way policy has conceived by last well is applicable to a particular area of policy making, which was the free healthcare policy. Yeah. So I couldn't find any evidence that actually it went through the sort of stages that have been proposed. Yeah. Rather, what I found was that uh, the president made a proclamation and then then people have to work backwards. Yeah. And in, in the case of the U UK, no. There have been a sort of agenda setting and then all the sort of process. But in Africa, it's not as neatly mm -hmm. applicable as we would have it on paper. The worry means that you have a case. And so what we want to establish is that once we have that, you have a case to describe in another context. It's, it's okay, we're not saying it's absolute, but we have to be careful with that. It's not just when, no, a, uh, when a scholar just starts and says, yes, it yeah. has been done here, has been done here, mm -hmm. but nothing is done here. So we need to know. Yeah. That you are knowing, is it adding any value? It may also be reproducing, reinventing the world. You're also producing the knowledge you know about the phenomenon. So you are not doing anything. That's just uh, the, the issue. It's not every theory that fits everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's no theory of everything. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Okay. So, but for example, assuming that you are that environment is also is rich, but uh, t or whatever theory is poor. What do, are you going to do? You are going to explore causality. You have data, but nothing is known so much that is causing certain things. What you'll be doing is to explore causality because you don't know the reason why these things are happening. In their last conference in Calabar, that was sometime uh, about two a month plus. Yes, I, I was in that conference and I did about two, three hours talk uh, presentation on why they should be emphasizing producing evidence for Niger political science. Yeah. For obvious reasons, why should, because all governors, president of the Federal Republic for the past 20 years have been appointing anybody, bricklayers, whoever they want, <laughs> as, as <laughs> chief, <laughs> chief political, uh, whatever, what do they call them? Yeah. Special